Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, John DeLynn. It's November 24th. We're now in the afternoon. Uh, following up with the second part of my interview with uh, scholar Matt Harris. Uh, you guys will know Matt Harris because he did that epic series with me a month or two ago about Ezra Tapp Benson. And then just this morning, we did a whole um, episode, several hours, on this amazing book. The book is the LDS Gospel Topic Series, a scholarly engagement published by Signature Books. It's edited by Matt Harris and Newell Bringhurst. I want to encourage everybody right now, as we're beginning, to go to Amazon and buy this book. I want Signature Books to be heavily rewarded for this amazing book, which talks about the LDS Church's Gospel Topics essays. It does an in-depth dive into um, each of the main Gospel Topics essays. We're talking Book of Abraham, uh, you know, polygamy, Mountain Meadows Massacre and Violence. You know, each of those essays is covered here. Uh, in the morning interview that I did with Matt, we talked about the history that led to the creation of the essays and the process of the creation of the essays and the reception of the essays and the quality of the essays. And that was all really important. I'm really glad we spent that time. This afternoon, uh, what we're going to be covering is chapter 10 from this amazing book. The chapter is called Whiteness Theology and the Evolution of Mormon Racial Teachings, and it's an essay written by Matt Harris, who is a professor of history at Colorado State University, Pueblo, and he's an amazing uh, historian. And he's also, uh, not only has he authored several books, but he's actually writing several books, and one of them, I believe, is going to be an in-depth dive on Blacks in the Priesthood and its entire history of race and Mormonism. Uh, Matt Harris, welcome back to Mormon Stories. It's so good to have you. Thanks, John. I appreciate it. Um, oh, go ahead. Yeah, no, I just, I'm happy to be here. I've enjoyed our conversations and I appreciate the, the questions and the comments that, that you bring to the table. And, and I appreciate your listeners um, being patient and tuning in. Yeah, well, my listeners love you. So they're like, we need to get Matt back on. So I'm, I'm worried about when we're going to have you on next. So uh, I'll be, I'll be trying to figure that out. But uh, we will be interviewing uh, several other um, authors of the various chapters in this book. But please go buy this book right now. Tell all your friends this book is amazing. This chapter in and of itself that we're about to cover is worth the price of the entire book. Again, it's called Whiteness Theology in the Evolution of Mormon Racial Teachings. So many of our listeners will have already just listened to our morning presentation. But for, but for those, let's just say someone just drops in on this episode, doesn't really know about the Black Priesthood Ban, doesn't know about the Gospel Topics Essays, do two minutes on that before we dive into the chapter. Is that okay? Yeah. So just a quick overview. The, the LDS Church had implemented a ban, priesthood and temple ban, on um, Black Latter-day Saints uh, in 1852. This was during the administration of Mormonism's second prophet president, uh, a guy named Brigham Young. Um, and then the ban was lifted 126 years later in 1978 by a church president named Spencer W. Kimball. And the church has, the church created this interesting rationale for the priesthood ban. They followed uncritically some of the, the uh, conventions of the day, mostly from Protestants, um, that black people bore the mark of a divine curse. And then by the latter part of the 19th century, just after the American Civil War, Latter-day Saints added their own unique twist to all of this, which is that uh, Black people were less valiant in this pre-Earth life. That is, they didn't make good decisions in this um, uh, life before they came to planet Earth, <laughs> if you will. And that was a unique Mormon uh, contribution to all of this. And then from, well, through the 20th century, particularly by the time of the civil rights movement in the 1960s, it was actually 50s. By the 1950s and then into the 60s, the church comes under heavy fire for these racist teachings. And a lot of uh, churches at the time were not friendly towards blacks, um, Protestants, Catholics. And the difference is, is that by the 1960s, most of these, uh, especially Southern Baptist churches, they start to integrate um, black people into their worship services. And Mormons, however, it takes them another whole decade after that 
uh, to really nod, make a nod towards racial equality. And then finally, um, after the revelation, the priesthood revelation that Spencer W. Kimball experiences in 1978, after that is announced, which allows black people to hold the priesthood and attend the faith's temples, then the church has this unique challenge of dealing with this racial residue, if you will, that still exists after the revelation. Um, and by residue, I mean that the curse and the less valiant position, the church doesn't deal with any of this past theology. And so it continues to linger in Mormon discourse. And it, it's deeply problematic for the church because it's trying to uh, globalize. And it's really hard to go into black African nations, for example, or Latin America or the Caribbean with this racial baggage that once taught that black people bore this divine curse. And so... Um, this leads me to 2013, that when the church produced these uh, gospel topics essays, one of them was dealing with race and priesthood. And for the first time in LDS church history, the church acknowledges uh, something that's quite extraordinary. They acknowledge that um, the curse and less valiant positions they had once taught all these years were no longer the teachings of the church. And that's really a monumental moment. Church also talks about that interracial marriage is not a sin, which is a dramatic departure from uh, previous teachings from various leaders. And finally, the church acknowledges that the that Joseph Smith had ordained a handful of black men to the priesthood. And that was really never overtly known before, at least acknowledged before um, among the high church leadership. And so the race and priesthood essay marks a series of firsts that's really um, important in this step forward towards not just more transparency, but really a more honest history about the church's past. I love it. Thanks for that overview. And I just want to say for people that that uh, don't want to, you know, acknowledge or that are hesitant to believe this this sort of story, because in 2020 it, it almost sounds outrageous. I'm 51 years old. I grew up in the 70s and 80s as a devout Orthodox Mormon. I had a copy of Mormon Doctrine, a first edition that taught that blacks were black because they were less valued in the pre-existence. I was taught in, in, in my seminary between 1984 and 1987 that blacks were fence sitters in the pre-existence and that the reason that they had dark skin was to set them apart um, as, as a curse. And uh, this was all part of my upbringing. So here I am growing up in Katy, Texas, a suburb of Houston with, you know, black friends and uh, in, a, in a, you know, in a, in a farming town where there used to be slaves. And I'm thinking, oh, I know why you're black, you know, but I'm not going to tell you because that's kind of offensive. And this was this was my upbringing. And so but at the same time, I was never comfortable with it. And I always wanted to see a change. And I was alive in 1978 and I was nine years old. And I remember when the change happened. And that was an amazing change, but we all were left wondering, but is, did it really change? Like, what about the doctrine? What about the theology? Mm -hmm. And so it really, it, it wasn't it wasn't for another several decades that the church decided to really address this. And so, yeah, as the church releases these gospel topics essays in 2013, right? That's when they first came out, the first one. Mm -hmm. What what month did the, the race and the priesthood essay come out? Hmm, good question. I think it was December. So was it the first or among the first? Um, I oh boy, I think it was. I'm I'm putting you on the spot there. That's okay. I think I think it was. I'm going to check into that. I I knew this at once upon a time. Might have slipped my memory, but I think it came out in December of 2013. There might have been one that came out in November of 2013, but I think that uh, my memory is the race and priesthood came out in December of 2013. What I don't remember is was there one out in November. But I do know it was, if it wasn't the first one that came out, it was probably the second one. It was among the earliest ones. Right. And for those uh, those who are asking, yes, the essay is available online. I've already shared a link to it. So scroll up on either YouTube or Facebook and you can actually see a link. It's You could just Google race and the priesthood and uh, it'll come right up on, on the churchofjesuschrist.org website. Uh, the essay is still there and available. So um, your your wonderful essay that, uh, again, is worth the price of the entire book, begins by mentioning what the essay does say. Mm 
And uh, you you gave us uh, an overview just now. And of course, we want to get to what it doesn't say. But is there anything else you want to say about what it does say and why it was important? Yeah, so, yeah, a couple of things. Um, so it says, as I mentioned, it acknowledges that that Joseph Smith was the uh, that ordained had ordained black people to the priesthood. And it acknowledges that the ban began in 1852 with Brigham Young. And the reason why that's really important is because the church is having to to address issues in its narrative that 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 were not there before. So, for example, Joseph Fielding Smith and others had always taught emphatically in Bruce McConkie, the ban began with the prophet Joseph Smith. And here you have a document saying that's not true. It began with Brigham Young. You also had a church that that didn't want to acknowledge that black people were ordained to the priesthood. And um, Elijah Abel is the earliest black Latter-day Saint, the first black Latter-day Saint to be ordained to the priesthood. And that was kind of an open secret throughout much of the 20th century. And the reason why Latter-day Saints knew about this, if they knew about it at all, is because um, assistant church historian, a guy named Andrew Jensen, who lived around the turn of the century, early 20th century, he wrote a four volume LDS encyclopedia. I think it's online now, so people can track it down. But he, it's, a, it's an, a biographical encyclopedia. And he has an, uh, an entry on Elijah Abel. And um, what, he, what year was that released about? Uh, this would have been a run in the early 20th century. So the teens into the early 1920s, I believe. So B.H. Roberts' time. Yes. Okay. And so here you have assistant uh, church historian Andrew Jensen acknowledging for the first time publicly in this writing, this four volume series, that uh, a black man held the priesthood. And that just sent shockwaves throughout the church. And so in the 1930s and 40s, um, Latter day Saints were reading this because it's, it's, it's open. It's, you know, you can buy it and own it. And they write the church authorities. They write David O. McKay, they write J. Reuben Clark, they write Joseph Fielding Smith, who was then the church historian. And they ask him a direct question. How is it that Brother Jensen says that this guy named Abel held the priesthood? And oh my goodness, they're they're not happy with these kinds of questions because it doesn't really fit with this narrative that the band began with Joseph Smith and that God wanted it that way. And there's a lot I could say about this, but I, I'm going to keep it easy. I know Paul Reeve um, has talked a little bit about this. He's done some good work with Elijah Abel's and also some other scholars. But anyway, um, in the, uh, the mid 20th century, the apostles addressed these questions in different ways. David O. McKay writes a concerned church member and he says, yes, it's true. He held the priesthood, but this was an exception, not the rule. So he owns up to it, acknowledges it. Joseph Fielding Smith one time says something that's classic. I mean, classic Joseph Fielding. Uh, I like the guy. He's really kind of comical. But he writes back to this sister from Logan, Utah. Uh, Dear Sister Priest, yes, it's true there was an Elijah Abel in Nauvoo who held the priesthood. But there were two Elijah Abels. It's the white guy who held the oh, priesthood. Oh, my gosh. I mean, Did he make that up or was he? BS. It's complete BS. And because uh, there's, he's stuck in a narrative. I like Joseph Fielding, but you know this wasn't his best moment. And um, he wrote back a different Latter Day Saint, I think the following year, and he acknowledges it. So he says something the exact opposite. He says that yes, there was Elijah Abel. Yes, he held the priesthood, but it was a mistake. And uh, so the point of all of this is, uh, and Reuben Clark said something entirely different. Reuben Clark went on record; he was going to give a general conference address. This is 1954, so the timing is crucial here. This is um, just after the historic Brown versus the Board uh, Supreme Court case that desegregated public schools. So Mormons and Americans in general are thinking about racial issues. And so Reuben Clark has this big general conference address that's uh, geared up for 1954, and he goes through three drafts with it. He writes a draft. He sends it to Spencer Kimball. He sends it to Mark E. Peterson. He sends it to David O. McKay, the church president, goes through a couple more drafts. In one of the drafts, he acknowledges that there were two, uh, he called them colored, two colored men in the early church who held the priesthood. That was interesting because that's the first time publicly that a high-ranking church leader will acknowledge this. And two, that it wasn't just Elijah Abel, 
which is all Jensen said, it's actually a second person. He doesn't say who it is. It could have been Walker Lewis or Joseph Ball. We don't know. And most likely Elijah Ailey. But anyway, David O. McKay said, you can't give this. And without giving a reason, um, he wouldn't let Reuben Clark uh, give this, this address. I have all three drafts of the, the uh, sermon, so it's kind of interesting. And clearly, David O. McKay, President McKay, didn't want him to give the address because of the civil rights movement, and the brethren didn't support it. And they didn't want to be talking about these issues that would bring attention to the church's stand on civil rights. Anyway, so go back just for a moment. So the race and priesthood essay acknowledges uh, that black men held the priesthood, whereas it had been a thorny issue for much of the 20th century. It was can, just like, can I ask you to just fill our listeners in on, on one really important point? You know, later, the whole black priesthood ban in the essay and in some of the rhetoric leading up to it is going to be to say it was policy, not doctrine. But there are first presidency statements declaring it as doctrine. Am I right? Oh, my gosh. Yeah, that, that's just so, <laughs> you know, we've talked about in pri prior, prior podcasts, John, about the need for transparency and honesty and how I think people are forgiving. You know, yes, my church once taught this. No, they don't teach it today. I'm so sorry this happened. Let's, you know, try to move forward and heal together. And unfortunately, that kind of mea culpa is not forthcoming, and it causes more damage, in my humble opinion, than not. And um, this is one of those instances where calling it a policy and not a doctrine is complete nonsense, and it's not sustainable by the, by the strictures of the church. And by that, I mean the church has made it very clear in the mid-20th century about what doctrine is and how it's constituted. And if I can take your listeners through a very crude, quick version of LDS doctrine that I think this might be helpful. In the 19th century, Brigham Young and Joseph Smith, when they gave sermons, they would, you know, in the name of the Lord Jesus, that would be the doctrine. And Brigham Young was very loose with this. He would say often that there's nothing I've never said to the children of men that cannot be construed over this pulpit as doctrine. He would say stuff like this. Well, one can imagine Russell Nelson standing up today and saying something similar, that what I speak, it's doctrine. And um, this whole nonsense that, you know, he'd be speaking as a man versus a prophet. That, that is about the most ridiculous, dishonest uh, statement. I'm going to be just blunt. It's not helpful and it's not sustainable because it puts the onus on the members to decide what's doctrine and what's not. Why not just be clear about what the doctrine is rather than leaving people guessing, right? We wouldn't have these these ridiculous conversations about, you know, can people drink caffeine, soda, the stuff that I grew up with hearing about. It's like there's an easy way to resolve this. What does the prophet say? What does the president say? But yet people were kept guessing. Anyway, so the church president of the 19th century, when he spoke, it was doctrine. And by the 20th century, um, for a variety of reasons, the church adopts this practice a bit and they uh, try to implement a series of checks and controls. And so by the 1940s, around World War II, the church issues a statement about how we know what's doctrine. And it becomes the authoritative statement of the church president, the prophet, and also his two counselors when they speak in unison in a prophetic pronouncement. Um, well, this might actually have been a little earlier than World War II. It probably stretches back in the early 20th century. But when they, when they release a statement with uh, the prophet's name and signature and his counselors, then that becomes the authoritative binding doctrine for the church. And um, by the 20th century, this sort of evolves. There was a sort of general conference talk given by, I think, Todd Christofferson, oh, seven or eight years ago. And when he talked, he added a layer to this evolution. He said that doctrine is created not just at the providence of the first presidency, but also through the collective voice of the twelve. And that never used to be the case. It was always the providence of the church president first, then the first presidency. Now it's sort of evolved to the 12. And some of the greatest rifts in LDS church history have been um, wrought over that very issue about doctrine, how it's disseminated and who gets to say it. Does the 12 have a say and, and all of that? So, but that's how it is today. It's, it's the first presidency and the 12 that produced doctrine for the church. And so having said that, um, there was no doctrine, LDS racial doctrine, up until, this is what my next book talks about in great detail. There was no LDS racial doctrine 
uh, up until 1949. Before that, it was just a patchwork of theories, of racial theories, and a patchwork of uh, practices, right? Um, uh, people are cursed, or, or Black people are cursed, or this low, less valiant stuff. Well, you said something earlier, uh, John, that you grew up in Katy, Texas, with this notion that Blacks were fence sitters. Well, that was a that was a teaching that was often talked about in the in the church, but that wasn't that wasn't commonplace. There are some people who very, who said apostles who said explicitly that wait a minute, black people were not fence sitters. They just told chose Satan's plan in the pre-existence. And the other half said, no, 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 no. They they were on the fence. They weren't quite sure. And nonetheless, the result was still the same. Whether they were fence sitters or chose Satan's plan, God cursed them and they couldn't hold the priesthood. But there are nuances and differences among the high church leadership. And this whole idea of being a fence sitter, it was, it, that was not always the accepted theory. But anyway, um, so we have all of these racial theories going on and the LDS race and priesthood essay that I critiqued in this book um, quotes a interesting passage from Joseph Fielding Smith when he was the assistant church historian. So this is 1906. This is four years before his call into the Quorum of the Twelve. He's a young man. He's in his early 30s. And he wrote a, a member that the essay quotes. They quote from this letter at the church archives. Uh, assistant church historian Joseph Fielding Smith writes a letter to a member and basically calls LDS racial teachings theories and opinions. That's really interesting, the theories and opinions. And it's a snapshot in time where there is no settled doctrine quite yet. There's a practice, but there's no doctrine. And that's really an important distinction. And uh, to speed this up, there's a lot I could say in the interim here. It causes a lot of trouble with the church and also among the high church leadership to have these different racial theories out there about black people being cursed, about being less valiant. Not everybody believes this stuff. For example, uh, David O. McKay does not believe black people are cursed. John Whitso does not believe black people are cursed. Marion Hanks doesn't believe black, black people are cursed. Spencer Kimball does not believe black people are cursed. They all believe in various forms of the less valiant stuff, except for Hanks and Hugh Brown. Um, but there's, there's a wide array of latitude. And furthermore, what's challenging is by the time of World War II, when the church starts to globalize and missionize, when they start to expand their missionary operations in Brazil, for example, um, and when they start to move into South Africa, two, two countries that give the church the biggest fits with the priesthood ban is these two countries that have a long history of race mixing, they have a long history of slavery, and um, they can't figure out who's got black blood and who doesn't. And so... They start to get the church starts to get criticized by their own members um, by the 1940s. And there's a former BYU professor. He taught Ezra Taft Benson at BYU in the 1920s, incidentally. His name is Lowry Nelson. And Lowry Nelson has this epic um, uh, letter exchange with the First Presidency over the race issue. He had heard that the church was trying to missionize in Cuba and they wanted they, they reached out to him through an intermediary. Um, who was the president of the Cuban mission, or would have been, a guy named Heber Meeks. And Meeks and Nelson knew each other um, back from their chumhood days in Farron, Utah. And Meeks told uh, Professor uh, Nelson, he said, look, I'm, I'm president of the Southern States Mission. The brethren want me to check out the feasibility of going into Cuba. And I know that you've been to Cuba as a scholar of sociology. You've done some field work there. Can you tell me where we should go where we could avoid Blacks? In other words, just teach white people. And that's what they tried in Brazil. They wanted to avoid uh, um, populations that had uh, black folk and just hit those Europeans who'd migrated to Brazil who didn't have the cursed ancestry. So anyway, Nelson writes him, his friend back. And he said, Meeks, dear Heber, what are you talking about? You're going to go to Cuba and open up a mission in Cuba when there's, there, there, there's black and biracial blood everywhere. That's crazy. And he was really put off by this. And that's the, what leads him to write the first presidency. And um, he, he wanted to know. He said, I've heard all this stuff about our racial teachings growing up, but is this the doctrine of the church? And um, that's, what he, that's what he says. I've heard all this stuff growing up. Is it the doctrine of the church? And the first presidency writes back, it's the doctrine. And they sign their names. And this becomes the first public statement in LDS church history, which codifies all of these 
theories that Joseph Fielding Smith and other apostles had been talking, Orson Hyde, uh, Melvin Ballard, how they've been talking about these racial theories for years. And now the church is on record saying, it is not just a theory, it's a doctrine of the church that was taught from the foundation of the world. And they lead one to believe that, that it was by divine revelation that this came about. And the irony of all of this is, there was never a revelation. They couldn't find one. They had looked and looked and looked. And of course, the brethren, you know, had lots of revelations they wrote down. We've got tons of them in the Doctrine and Covenants, of course, and some that were not uh, canonized. Um, but they couldn't find a, a, a revelation. And they looked. They talked about it. I mean, Joseph F. Smith, Joseph Fielding Smith, they wanted to find a revelation that tied the priesthood band to Joseph Smith. And even though they couldn't find one, they still said in this 1949 authoritative first presidency statement that Joseph Smith was behind the ban. And that's deeply problematic because they don't have any evidence for this. But by 1949, the church has codified its racial theories and put it into doctrine. And so from 1949, it goes forward as doctrine. And every general authority and their dog talks about it as doctrine. And obviously, you know, when people say that um, it's, it's an opinion or a theory, which is completely bogus, one can just remind them that, you know, there are two books by the church's foremost theologians of the 20th century, Joseph Fielding Smith and Bruce McConkie. Both books have the word doctrine in the title. So <laughs> to say that, you know, they were theories and, well, Mormon doctrine, that's interesting. He talks about this being a doctrine, you know, the, the race issue. And then, of course, every other general authority talk about it as a doctrine. And what's interesting is um, the Latter-day Saints see it as a doctrine. It's both a practice and a doctrine. It's both a policy and a doctrine. And it's funny, when you when you look at BYU religion professors in the 1950s and 60s, when they exchange letters and memos, they always call it the Negro doctrine. And by 1969, the second time in LDS church history, the church will go on record with a, with a public statement. Um, they produce a second statement in 1969. And of course, it's construed as doctrine. Um, so there's two public statements. And then the third statement that the church makes about race and its history, uh, meaning that it bears the imprimatur of the high church leadership, is the race and priesthood uh, document. And so there are three statements on race in LDS church history. There's 1949, which establishes it as doctrine, canonizes it as doctrine, and then 1969, and then finally in 2013. So you can see the, the bookend nicely in 1949 and in 2013. Let me, uh, I want to say something that I think is, is fascinating. Years ago, I gave a, a paper at a conference, and it was about this very issue, right? This, this, it's just unsustainable to call it a policy or an opinion of a few leaders, because really, the vast, vast majority of Latter-day Saint apostles taught it as doctrine. There's a few that, you know, Hugh Brown is one of them that didn't. But anyway, um, I was talking to a, after my paper, a, uh, a man who works for the church approached me um, and I didn't never met him before. He was a nice, nice man. He worked for the correlation department and um, he, he just wanted to follow up with me on some things that I said about doctrine and practice. And I said to him, I said, he said, well, some of us brethren want to call it a, a practice and a policy. And I said, you can call it a practice and a policy, but do not call it folklore. That's a disingenuous way to not own your past because it's not folklore. And don't do that. It's disingenuous. That's what I said to him. Don't call it folklore like some people were doing. It's just folklore. Um, and then the second thing is I said, the problem with, with just calling it a policy and a practice, which it was, but the problem with just stopping there and not acknowledging it as a doctrine is that 1949 statement. And he looked at me and he said, oh, you know, just looked at me and he said, yeah, that's a hard one to get around. So he acknowledged the 49th statement. He was aware of it. And I said that um, that 49th statement's out there in which it explicitly calls it doctrine. And the 1969 statement does not call it doctrine um, for a lot of reasons. They're trying to move away from some of the racial teachings at that point because of the civil rights movement. So, um, and then just finally here, I'll end here, that in the early 20th century, this is where you start to get some private letters from the church PR people. They're calling it folklore. They're calling it... Um, a policy, theories, you know, the theories of a few general authorities. And that's the bind that the church is in the early 21st century is they, they're just not ready to um, own up to it as doctrine yet. And they're not ready to 
uh, much less to change it, which is what they do in 2013, to say it's no longer doctrine. And that was the biggest implication about calling it doctrine, is that some people in the high church leadership think that if you call it doctrine, um, you shouldn't because doctrines don't change. And then there are other apostles who argue that's not true. Doctrines change all the time. That's the beauty of modern day revelation. So that was really the impetus for not owning up to it as doctrine is, is that uh, they didn't want to get in the business of saying that the doctrine had changed. Boyd Packer was one here who argued that doctrines don't change. Policies do, but not doctrines. So that's, that's really the, the main motive for calling it a doctrine or a policy, not a doctrine. Right. That okay. Yeah, no, that's great. That's a really crucial background for for then exploring what the essay does and doesn't acknowledge. And uh, so, what? It, tell us again what the essay tries to suggest around doctrine versus policy. Well, one of the critiques that I make is is that the the essay um, it gives a false impression that these were just the LDS racial teachings were just theories. And they quote that 196 letter from Joseph Fielding Smith, which is deeply problematic because for two reasons. One, he gives the false impression that Joseph Fielding Smith was an apostle at that time when he wasn't. And two, it, they just sort of cherry picked the letter to, to create, to, to justify the narrative they were trying to create that it wasn't doctrine. And, and what's ironic about this 1906 letter from Joseph Fielding Smith, who was then the assistant church historian, What's ironic about it is Joseph Fielding Smith goes on to become apostle, an apostle four years later, and he, more than anybody else, creates the theological scaffolding for black priests of denial. And he writes a book in, uh, publishes a book in 1930 called The Way to Perfection. And it, it's the, really the first systematic attempt to make sense of the priesthood ban. And, um, and he's, the, he's kind of an interesting fellow. He doesn't have much of a formal education. He went to a couple of years of high school. He's he's a Mormons don't use the word fundamentalist because that's what evangelicals do, right? You can say that people are evangelicals are fundamentalists. Mormons are not fundamentalists by and large, meaning that uh, we we believe in evolution, we believe in um, various other elements that might not make us, uh, you know, fall into that fundamentalist line. But Joseph Fielding Smith and Bruce McConkie, if, if there is a Mormon fundamentalism, it's them. And um, Joseph Fielding was very literal in, in his reading of the Bible. He didn't have a lot of flexibility intellectually for nuance. Um, and if the Bible said that there was a guy in the belly of the fish for a few days, hey, that's what happened. And of course, some of the folks with PhDs like John Whitsell and James Towns, they thought that was nonsense. Um, it's okay to take some of this as figurative language, but Joseph Fielding wouldn't have any of that. Anyway, um, but Joseph Fielding Smith is on a one-man mission to codify the church's racial teachings. And the church will use the way to perfection in lesson manuals. They'll, uh, when anyone asks the first presidency in the 1930s and 40s about uh, LDS racial teachings, they would say, have you seen chapters 15 and 16 of the way to perfection? Yeah, you need to read Brother Smith's book. That has all the answers. So that's how influential this book was. And it went through mul multiple iterations. Well, 1986 is when it was finally taken out of print because it was controversial. And then um, the, the um, Kindle ed edition wasn't removed until, I think, 2018 because um, one of my friends had complained about it and wrote the church leaders. Anyway, um, so it's the way to perfection. Joseph Fielding Smith's book, The Way to Perfection, that becomes the basis of that important 1949 First Presidency statement that J. Reuben Clark who, who was one of the first presidency counselors who writes these most of these pronouncements under the signatory of um, uh, Heber J. Grant when he was in Grant's administration, George Albert Smith, and then eventually David O. McKay. It was mostly these, these first presidency announcements are written by Clark. So, um, so he writes this, and Joseph Hilding Smith's book influences him heavily um, as he creates this narrative about the band beginning with Joseph Smith, founded on Revelation, and that was codified into doctrine with that important statement. Got it. <clears throat> okay. So um, in terms of kind of going through again, just what you have on 248, it, it, there, there's a couple of interesting things, and you highlight some of these things. It seems like the essay tries to say that it was Brigham Young. It kind of seems to throw Brigham Young under the bus, and it kind of, also wants to say it's human error. 
It kind of wants to say that, you know, they were all products of their time. Um, but it also kind of wants to throw God under the bus. What do you sing the essay try to do in terms of responsibility for for what gets said? Does that does that make sense? Well, yes. It's a hard question to answer because I think there are a lot of opinions about this, John, um, all the way up to the very top of the church about how do we do this? Is God responsible for this racism or is Brigham Young responsible for it? How, how do we tell this story? And on our last segment, I mentioned that this was this was not good language. It was they obfuscated a lot of this. And they purposely made it vague so people could find what they wanted to find into it. And I shared the story with my brother who read it and who didn't see what I saw in it, which was that the church is trying to say that, that slavery began or the priesthood ban began during Brigham Young's day um, because of the cultural conditions in which the ban emerged. This is slaveholding America. Mormons are and Americans are racist. Right. And that's not what my brother read into it. But I can tell you, having talked to people who, who wrote this and participated in drafting it, that was the intent that wanted to that they wanted to convey. And um, one of my friends, Darius Gray, who participated in this, for some of your listeners who might not know him, Darius Gray is an African-American who joined the church in 1964 in Colorado Springs, not too far from where I live in southern Colorado. And uh, Darius um, did what most good Mormons do. They go to BYU. And so Darius went to BYU. He was one of two or three African-Americans at BYU at the time, and which is another whole story about how he was treated as a black man and the difficult circumstance that Darius was in, as well as the two other African-Americans who were told, of course, not to date white people, white, white, white girls. And so, but the, the dilemma, of course, is I can't date um, any white girls here, but who do I date? And who am I to marry? There are so few African-American Latter-day Saints. So it was really a, a perplexing situation. They're taught to marry in the church, but they're also taught to marry within their own race. And that becomes this interesting conundrum. And for Darius, um, he gets really, really upset. And, and I totally, I, I feel it, I hear it. When Latter-day Saints would give a justification on the priesthood ban, imputing that it was God's doing. And that the Joseph Fielding Smith response, this is the one that I learned growing up as I talked to my father, who was a, a bishop. I said, well, what is it about? Why, why can't black people hold the priesthood? What is it about that? And this would have been the 80s. So it would have been, why couldn't they, I guess? And um, he, his response was the typical biblical response. Well, God had selected certain groups of people for the priesthood back in the Old Testament times. And so it was with with modern times in the church. And so really what you're saying is you're pinning the, the ban on God. And Darius, when he hears that stuff, he gets really upset or he's sensitive to it because um, he participated in the construction of this essay. And that was really important to both him and others that God is not responsible for this, that it simply began um, by a church president who had some harsh and demeaning things to say about black people. And, you know, that shouldn't be... <laughs> To any Latter-day Saint who hears this, this should not be some kind of faith crisis, in my humble opinion, because in the 19th century, I don't know too many people who were not racist. Even Abraham Lincoln, the wonderful emancipator, had some very strong views about black people. He didn't like slavery, but he didn't believe in racial equality either. And he was very clear on that. And somehow we think that he's some progressive uh, person with race when uh, Lincoln, when he, when he wasn't. Um, anyway, so so Brigham Young is definitely a product of his time. Um, there's no question Young says some things that his contemporaries wouldn't believe when he talks about interracial marriage and if a black and a white person marry, there shall be death on the spot. I'm quoting, paraphrasing a quote. I mean, that's a harsh thing to swallow. There's not a lot of 19th century theologians who are going as far as Young talking about that an interracial marriage should result in death to one or both of the participants. I mean, that's really going a step above and beyond. Most theologians from the Protestant tradition would argue against interracial marriage because they believed in pure white bloodstreams. But as far as I know, they didn't advocate for the taking of one's life. So Young was definitely um, cut from a different cloth from some of his contemporaries. Um, and that's, you know, a lot of this stuff should not be really radical 
and why some of the brethren didn't want to make it more clear that the band began with Young, just simply out of the racist culture of his day. Um, I, I don't find that problematic at all. Maybe I'm desensitized to it. I've been studying this stuff as a historian, as a teacher, as a researcher. But I, I do think that people would could grasp that. They can understand that. And to suggest that God is still responsible or to leave that possibility open in this essay, it, it just doesn't do the church any good. And, and I know that some of the people, again, who worked on this, they wanted to make it more clear, but it got, I think it got watered down the higher up it went. Right. The essay itself. Yeah. The essay itself. Yeah. Okay. Um, a couple other things that you, in your restatement of what the essay says, you talk about how the church had historically had a ban on mixed race marriage. Um, and, uh, and the essay deals with that, right? Yes. Briefly. And yeah. what, what is it? What does it basically say? It says that, I'm going to paraphrase here, I don't have the essay in front of me, but it basically says that it's not a sin to, to be involved in interracial marriages. And if I could just say a, a quick word about that, John, if that's all right. Um, so this is kind of interesting. So in the 19th century, of course, um, Latter-day Saints are not unusual. The vast, vast, vast majority of people in the United States, since Brigham Young, Joseph Smith's day, well into the 20th century, they do not support interracial marriage. And in fact, just a little history here, it's um, in the 1850s when Americans in general try to create some kind of a nomenclature or a yardstick, if you will, to determine who's black and who's not. And this is really the first time in the American lexicon that I can find in the 1850s where they come up with this so-called one drop rule, that if you have one drop of Negro ancestry, as they called it, that somehow you were classified as being black. Now, just process that for a moment, that you have one drop of African blood in you. You could look perfectly white, but yet if your grandpa was black, then somehow uh, you're deemed black. And the reason why they came up with a one drop rule in the 1850s is quite simple. They wanted to keep black and white people, slaves and, and, and whites from having sex. That's what it was. And that's how you could police those racial markers is by coming up with this this completely arbitrary racial designation. And then after the American Civil War, when the South has been defeated, that um, uh, there are a number of states that try to codify into legislation um, about how they delineate a black person because now they start to segregate society. They don't want blacks and whites to mix and mingle. Why? Because they're afraid of interracial marriage. If they work together, they go to school together, they, they live in the same neighborhoods together, then somehow that'll create a fraternity and ultimately lead in marriage. And that's what Americans want to avoid. And so they start to codify a lot of this stuff in the late 19th century and into the early 20th century. And they go through these ridiculous fractions. You know, if you lived in one state, if you were 132nd African-American, you were considered black. The next state over, if you were uh, one fourth or one eighth, I mean, it's crazy. You could be designated black in one state and go to the next state and not be designated black. And the church, um, I think it's 1930 that the federal laws start to buy into some of this nonsense. They come up with the um, 1930 census, I think, they classify anyone black with one quarter or one drop. Actually, it's one drop. Well, the church follows the one drop rule, which is the, the um, it's the most draconian way to measure ancestry. Because one drop means that anywhere in your ancestry, decades back, generations back, you could be considered black. And um, once again, I, I want to add that this deals not with your skin color, but it deals with your, your ancestral line. And um, so you could have a very, very dark skinned Tongan um, who could hold the priesthood because he doesn't have any African lineage. Then you could have some white dude with blonde hair and blue eyes who had a great grandpa who was from Africa and from black Africa. And, um, and they would be, they would have the curse. And that really was shocking to a lot of people, both in and out of the church, that a dark-skinned Tongan could have the priesthood, but yet some dude with light skin, blonde hair, blue eyes would be shut off. And uh, this is a larger issue in American society about how to detect uh, race and how to deal with race. And um, in the church, it was really a fascinating topic because there were a lot of people um, in the church who were, who were passing below the color line. 
That is that they were pretending to be white when they when they had this African ancestry. There were people in South Africa, as I write about in my book, who would leave South Africa because it was known that they had a cursed ancestry. They didn't look black, but they had a cursed ancestry. They would leave South Africa and they would travel to Salt Lake and uh, they would show up and they would interview with their bishop and their stake president and they would be given temple recommends and they'd be ordained to the priesthood just because they didn't look black. And um, Dryas Gray uh, was told by Eldridge G. Smith back in the 60s, um, <laughs> Eldridge G. Smith um, withheld lineage from Darius, didn't give him a lineage, um, recognizing that pronouncing the curse of Cain on black people would be deeply problematic, not theologically, because Smith believed in all that nonsense, but just that it wouldn't, it wouldn't help the person receiving the blessing. And obviously to receive a patriarchal blessing, this is a special moment in the life of a Latter-day Saint. It's supposed to give you a roadmap to your future, your eternal salvation. And to be told that you're cursed from this biblical counterfigure is deeply unsettling. Anyway, so Elder C. Smith withheld lineage from Dryas. And um, he told, it said something interesting to Dryas. He said, uh, he said, you know, if you weren't here in the United States and you went to, um, I think he's, I think he said Tonga. He said, if you went to Tonga, they wouldn't even question you. They would ordain you to the priesthood because everybody with dark skin in Tonga held the priesthood and you'd fit right in there. And that's, uh, that was, that was something that was unsettling to him to hear that because obviously there were some, there was an inequity among these racial practices at the time. So anyway, the church is following this one drop rule and the, the church, um, uh, so they don't like interracial marriage. Um, and, for the people who were light skinned and deemed cursed, that was that was a challenge because um, here you have I'm thinking of examples in my research that I'm going to talk about in my next book. You've got um, I'm thinking of a guy from Utah who's got light skin. He, he's blonde hair and blue eyes. That's what David O. McKay says about him when he interviewed him. He's got blonde hair and blue eyes. And this poor kid, uh, he, he said to the church president um, and also Joseph Filling Smith, he interviewed with two apostles. He said, what, what am I to do? I mean, I'm not going to marry a black person because I'm not black. I don't identify as African-American. But on the other hand, you're telling me I can't marry a white girl because I can't take her to the temple. I'm cursed. What do I do? He's in racial no man's land. And what was interesting about this is that David O. McKay, who most people don't know this, but he tended to be liberal about these kinds of things. He's like, oh, yeah, we're going to ordain you and put you on a mission. This is ridiculous. And Joseph Fielding Smith, of course, when he interviewed the same same kid, he just said, I I'm so sorry, I've got nothing for you. I don't have any counsel for you, which is really shocking because Joseph Fielding Smith had counsel about a lot of things. And for him to right. tell this young kid that he didn't have any counsel for him, uh, what was he supposed to say? And so um, this was going on. They were, they were ordaining people, at least some of the apostles, like David O, was um, ordaining people to the priesthood when he knew that they had cursed ancestry. And also, too, um, there are no ways to determine or to detect these bloodlines. That's there, There's no scientific proof in these days to figure out who's got the curse or the blood. That's what they call it, the blood. And um, they would look at genealogy. They would try to determine through genealogy. They would um, they would put uh, the, the onus on these beleaguered patriarchs, you know, let the patriarchs figure it out. And if they feel inspired during the blessing to bless them with Cain, the curse of the lineage of Cain, then that means they're cursed. And, but that becomes problematic when you get a darker skinned person in there and they bless them with the blessings of Ephraim, the lineage of Ephraim and the lineage of Ephraim for your listeners who may not know this lineage theology, um, Latter-day Saints would designate lineage through one of the 12 tribes of Israel. And through that lineage bore certain responsibilities for the church. So for example, if you were from the lineage of um, Aaron, that you had a right to the Aaronic priesthood. Um, uh, if you were from the lineage of um, Ephraim, your responsibility was to bless and preside over the church. And that's code word for lead the church, hold the priesthood, lead the church. And then if you're a black person, you were deemed outside of the uh, house of Israel altogether from a, a, an extra lineage, a, a cursed lineage. And that would be that of Cain and Ham. And so in Canaan. And so, um, so Mormons were into this lineage in the 20th century, and they put the onus on patriarchs, in some cases, to determine lineage. And a lot of patriarchs felt deeply apprehensive about this because they recognized that a person's fate was in their hands, whether he could serve a mission, marry in the temple, 
and otherwise be a full equal in the church. And so there was a lot of anxiety among the, the church patriarchs when they had to give a blessing to uh, someone who looked uh, black. And um, anyway, so back to the, the race and priesthood essay uh, with interracial marriage, they acknowledge that interracial marriage is no longer a sin. It had never been codified as a doctrine. You never saw it anywhere in the church handbook. But clearly, the leaders had talked about it in their sermons over the years um, about interracial marriage and how it would pollute the purity of the bloodstreams. That's what J. Reuben Clark said at one point. And by the 1960s, you get a little bit of a different shift from that. I mean, when you say pollute the purity of the bloodstreams, I mean, that just sounds horrible. It sounds like Nazi Germany in many ways, um, this pure Aryan race. But by the 1950s and into the 60s, you get a sort of a different strand of this, which is Spencer Kimball. He's reading marital prescriptive literature, which suggests that, <clears throat> that the most happy marriages uh, during this is a World War II sort of generation thought, that the most happy marriages are ones where people marry within their faith, within their race, and within their socioeconomic background. So if you're a good Catholic, marry a good Catholic. If you're middle class, marry middle class. If you're um, an Asian, marry an Asian. And what happens is, is that um, after the war is over, World War II is over, uh, these American GIs from Utah, they're coming back with Asian wives and they're violating the interracial statutes of Utah that were put in place just after the American Civil War. And um, in 1963, so this is you know at the height of the civil rights movement, something interesting happened. There were some state lawmakers who came into David O. McKay's office and they said, what do we do with this? We, we've got people who are coming, Latter-day Saint GIs who are coming back from the war with their Asian brides and they're, um, they're, they're breaking the law. What do we do? And David O. says, I guess we have to, we have to lift this, to change this interracial statute. We've got to get rid of it. And of course, some of the state lawmakers, one of whom was from Penguich, he gives this oration on the day they were supposed to lift it. And he says, I'm worried that this will open up the floodgates for blacks and whites, that blacks and, or that Negroes, as he said, and white people will, will marry. And that can't happen. And David O. McKay was worried about that too. But they lifted the interracial statute in 1963, um, not because anyone was promoting interracial marriage. It's because they wanted to, they didn't want to criminalize Latter-day Saint GIs marrying Asians and bringing them back uh, from the war. And then by 1967, the U.S. Supreme Court will strike down interracial match marriage statutes throughout the country in a famous case called Loving v. Virginia. So uh, let me end the story here with one last thing about interracial marriage. Um, interracial marriage, black sexuality is, it really looms over everything with this entire discussion. And it, it's the reason why many of the apostles don't support civil rights. If you break down protections in housing and jobs, that means that blacks and whites can live among each other and work among each other. And that's what they don't want. And the brethren are reading uh, literature that talks about how the races will become mongrelized, which is a horrible term that, that the Klan would use. Mongrel meaning a lesser breed. Uh, dogs, you know, rather than purebred dogs, this would be a dog breeding with a lower bred. And the implication is obvious. White people be breeding with lower breed, black people. So they're reading stuff. It talks about mongrelization. And a lot of people are reading this crap in the 50s and 60s. And um, anyway, so um, by the 1970s, let me end the story here because there's, there's a lot we can say about this. But in the 1970s, when the priesthood revelation is um, issued, um, one of the apostles uh, insist that there ought to be a proviso in the Deseret News right alongside of the priesthood revelation or the manifesto, as it was called, that, that still said that interracial marriage was wrong. And it quoted Spencer Kimball. And this, this uh, Spencer Kimball quote that was republished in the Deseret News on June 9th, 1978, it was the same one that was still in LDS manuals well up until I think a year or two ago. And, um, so the church has always been concerned about interracial marriage. And when the priesthood revelation came, a lot of black Latter-day Saints, they approached the brethren and they said, uh, why are we still getting pushback on interracial marriage? We understood why before we couldn't take our brides to the temple, but that is no longer the case. It's a moot point. Why the hold up now? And it really put the church in a difficult theological position. You get people like Marion Hanks, who was wonderful. He, he would counsel 
um, interracial couples at BYU, he would say, oh, I think you could break down so many racial barriers. This is such a tremendous blessing, both for you and the church. So he's giving him his warm encouragement. Then you get uh, the late Boyd Packer, just the exact opposite. Don't do it. You've got a mission in life. And then Spencer Kimball, they would turn to President Kimball to mediate these differences between Packer and Hanks. And um, uh, Kimball, uh, at least a few occasions that I know of, I'm sure there are more, but at least on three occasions that I have documentation for, um, President Kimball met with a black woman at, at BYU. And she asked him, she said, I've heard from two apostles, my stake president, my bishop, that I shouldn't marry this guy, this white guy that I'm engaged to. And uh, I need to know. I'm getting all of these conflicting voices. I love this man. I have nobody else to marry. I mean, there's no other black men at BYU at the time, uh, at least that she was, were possible suitors. And President Kimball, he just, he, he was very honest with him. It's truly really an admirable moment. He said, you know, we teach that the races ought to marry within themselves. And so he's harking back to this prescriptive literature that he had been influenced by from the World War II generation. But he said, in terms of being the doctrine of the church, it is not, you have my blessing. And he hugs the woman, they both weep, they embrace, and she goes out, you know, electrified that the church president has now blessed her union with this white man, and they marry. And um, so the interracial marriage, um, uh, oh boy, um, it still has an interesting issue today in the church. Um, certainly it's, it's, it's commonplace, it's it's known, it's out there, but there are still some people in the church who, who don't agree with it. Boyd Packer, I'm told, to the day he died, did not support interracial marriage. No surprise there. David Bednar, just two years before he became an apostle, gave a devotional address at BYU-Idaho in which he cautioned against interracial marriage. I mean, that, that's amazing to me. That's, this is the 21st century. You'd think it was in Alabama 1930. And um, I know this because I've gone through the Genesis files and some of their records and the Genesis group leadership, it's a black Latter-day Saint support group that meets in Salt Lake. And they have different um, branches throughout the, the country, the United States. They have one in LA and Oakland and back East. Anyway, uh, but the Genesis where it all started was in Salt Lake and the Genesis branch president at the time received, I don't know, a lot of different inquiries, uh, phone calls and emails from BYU Idaho students in interracial relationships and marriages. And they called him. They said, what is going on here? The BYU Idaho president and future apostle, which of course they didn't know at the time, but he's just cautioning against interracial marriage. And it wasn't Bednar's finest moment. It was creating a problem where a problem didn't need to occur. So the, the interracial marriages, um, for the church to acknowledge that it's okay and that it's not a sin, that again is one of those things that the church had been preaching about most emphatically for decades. And in 2013, the church says, it's okay. It's, you're not in trouble with the church. What a relief. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I, you know, it's crazy. Really quick, um, there are a lot of, uh, there have always been rumors. I heard this in 1987-88 as a BYU freshman, that, that one of the main reasons the 78 revelation came is because the church's tax exempt status was being threatened. This is not related to your S to the essays, but do you have any information on that that you want to share now versus not? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that's, I write about this in my book. That's complete BS. Um, so I've written about this elsewhere too. Um, what happens is, is I don't want to go into too much detail here because I, I go into a lot of detail about the government goes after the church and BYU hardcore. And I'll just give you a, your listeners a teaser. Uh, I deal with this in over 100 pages with great detail. It's a really interesting story. Um, the, uh, the church goes after BYU in the late 60s um, for violating the Civil Rights Act of 1964. You know, when you only have a couple of three black people at BYU, you know, Geez, hmm, we've got a problem. So, and clearly there was a problem. And um, BYU didn't have this policy to turn black people away. They weren't that stupid to write it in their, you know, catalog. Um, everybody else is accepted here except black people. But they they went to extraordinary lengths to discourage them from coming. They would send them this letter, you know, hey, if you come here, we can't keep you. But you should know that you can't date white girls and that you won't find a community here because we don't have any Negroes in Provo, Utah County. So really, they, they tried to discourage them. And um, 
again, interracial marriage. That's what's this idea of black sexuality. Uh, so the government's on to them. They don't have any black faculty either. And, and then we, another issue is with women, which I don't want to talk about right now today. That's good. No, don't. <laughs> but, they, but they go after, but they go after women too, um, uh, black faculty and women. And the church runs afoul of the federal government. And the law school is in jeopardy of not being uh, um, accredited. And so the government's coming after him hardcore. And the Nixon administration has made it very clear that um, that they're going to target uh, educational institutions, even private ones, who have these, these racist policies. So the church is really worried about this. And um, the Jimmy Carter administration, so obviously he's a couple of presidents later after Nixon, but Jimmy Carter uh, sends a message that he too wants to sharpen, to tighten up on this. And the government, they do go after a place called, a university called Bob Jones in South Carolina. And Bob Jones, unlike BYU, they were not smart. They put on their, their catalog, you know, Negroes are not welcome here. And uh, they just didn't want Negroes, as they said, to use their language. And so what happened was the, the U.S. government, the IRS, stripped Bob Jones of their tax exemption status. And Carter upheld this. His administration upheld it. It started with Nixon and it continued on. And so Mormons are following this case very carefully. And you can see the implications of all of this stuff, right? That if they go after Bob Jones, they can go after BYU and they can go after, you know, women in the priesthood. They can go after any number of things. And um, anyway, so I wrote Jimmy Carter a note a long time ago, 2013. And I said, you know, I've read on the Internet. I read everywhere else that you're that you targeted Mormons and uh, that you use the IRS to threaten them to change their race policy and also ERA. The Carter administration was not happy with the Mormons for their opposition to ERA. And uh, Carter wrote me back a really nice note. He just said, I don't have any recollection of doing any of that stuff. However, I did reach out to the Mormons on their missionary program. I was really interested in that. And um, I've gone through the Jimmy Carter papers in Atlanta. And I have family there. So it's kind of nice to go see my family and also spend some lovely time at the Jimmy Carter Library. And I found some great stuff on his views towards Mormons in the church that I'm going to write about, but nothing with the IRS. And so to answer your question, John, that's a bunch of smoke and mirrors. Um, uh, there is one part to the story that your, your listeners should know is that in um, June of 1978, the LDS church historian Leonard Arrington writes in a letter to his children. And he also writes this in his diary. He says that the church that I learned from talking to legal counsel. So Arrington had been talking to the church's legal counsel. I can't remember the guy's name at the moment. Um, he's dead now. I tried to interview him. But anyway, uh, Arrington had talked to the church's legal counsel. And the legal counsel said to Arrington, who then said to his children in the form of this letter, and also wrote it in his journal, that the, the IRS was going after the church in Wisconsin. And there was one other state, Wisconsin, I can't remember the other state. And then there was, they're possibly looking into Hawaii. And uh, so that was interesting. Um, and he, but Arrington speculated that this may have had something to do with the revelation. So maybe Arrington plants this little seed. But um, after contacting uh, the IRS division in Wisconsin, and I can't remember if it was Pennsylvania. I did this so many years ago, like seven years ago. Anyway, they didn't find anything that the IRS had done to the LDS church there in a decentralized fashion. And I can tell you after having gone through Spencer Kimball's diaries on more than one occasion, his private papers and other issues, the IRS is not a factor in his determination to lift the ban. The real issue, if I had to just be brief about this, the real issue is, is a couple of things. One is Kimball has this universalist vision to, to spread Mormonism, and he recognizes intuitively that you know, ever member a missionary, John, you heard that growing up. I heard that. And um, lengthen your stride. So he wants to globalize the church and bring the church into India, into Russia. This is during the Cold War and other places. And uh, Kimball recognizes intuitively that you can't do this if you if, if you can't get into black Africa and some other places. So so that the, the, the band conflicts with his universalist vision. That's the first point. The second point is is that they're, they're ordaining black people to the priesthood. They know it, and they don't know what to do about it. They don't have any foolproof way to determine who has the cursed lineage. Uh, 
So they know this is going on all over the place. That's the second thing that goes on. And then thirdly, um, they're building temples everywhere, including Brazil. And the LDS Gospel Topics essay talks about this, that uh, the Brazil temple plays a pivotal role in the uh, lifting of the priesthood ban. And what the essay doesn't say, because I don't think they know about this, this is a big part of my next book, is that Kimball has to convince the hardliners to lift the ban. He knows it needs to be done for the good of the church, but he has a bunch of people who don't want to lift the ban. And the genius of President Kimball is he finds a way to get them on board. And he uses the Brazil temple as sort of a cudgel to do that. He goes to the apostles one by one and also collectively. And he says, um, we're building this temple in Brazil. You and I both know that it's got such a long history of mixed race marriages. And I have no idea how we'll grant these people a temple recommend because we all know they probably have the curse. And, um, and I need your help. What, what do we do? And moreover, these people have been so, donating their time and their talents to build this temple. They were, I mean, really, one woman, um, Javier Martins, the first black general authority, he's from Brazil. He's called it in the second quarter of the 70s, 1990, by um, none other than Ezra Daph Benson, which is ironic. And um, Elder Martins was a, he was a hometown hero. James Faust and uh, Spencer Kimball, they, and Bruce McConkey too. They knew about this man's dedication to the church, even though he couldn't hold the priesthood. His wife had sold her jewelry. Havecchio himself was raising money, um, doing what he could to get other Brazilian Latter-day Saints to donate and sacrifice for this, uh, this temple. And this just crushed Kimball, that this would go on, and that yet this beautiful family would not be able to enjoy the privileges of the temple. And that, more than anything else, tugged at Kimball's heartstrings. And the IRS and all that stuff is just sort of ancillary. And um, yeah, this church was getting sued all over the place, by the way. But that, I, there is absolutely no evidence that this was that, that lawsuits were part of it. They were just sort of a you know an annoyance, if you will, um, just sort of a burr into your saddle. The church has been sued before all over the place, and so it, it was really annoying. But really, it conflicted with his universalist vision. They were already uh, ordaining black men to the priesthood unwittingly. And then finally, he recognized the sacrifices of these Latter-day Saints in building a temple they wouldn't be permitted to, to enter. And the genius of Kimball, as I explain in my book, is that he has to convince the bigots and the 12 to come on board. And that's no easy thing. These people that have been ingrained in these racial practices for so long. And how he does it with Bruce McConkey and some others is really nothing short of amazing. That's Marky e. Peterson, Ezra Tap Benson, right? Bruce, Bruce R. McConkie. Yeah, if I Bruce were to ask your readers who the biggest holdups were, they would probably say Bruce McConkey, and but they'd be wrong. Bruce McConkie is one of the first people who comes around to the priesthood ban. In uh, a year before the revelation in 1977, Elder McConkie, um, uh, Kimball convinces him that he needs to, uh, that the ban needs to be lifted. And Kimball, of course, recognizes the centrality in Elder McConkey. Elder McConkey is huge. And uh, one of the things that Kimball does, as I talk about the book, is he dispatches Kimball to Brazil. He's on this recon mission to check out the Brazilian Latter-day Saints to see if they have the leadership capacity for the priesthood. And um, there's more I'll say about that in my book. Um, I've got some great sources on all of this stuff. But anyway, um, so he wins McConkey over and... Uh, the people that have the holdups, though, is um, there's no question. Marky e. Peterson, Ezra Taft Benson, and Delbert Stapley. That's right. Yeah, Delbert, Delbert Stapley. And there's a reason why um, that Marky e. Peterson's in South America at the time of the revelation. He is not on record supporting it. Whereas when they went to the temple during their typical apostle and first presidency meeting on Thursday, um, I think it's the, it was the first, third Thursday, whatever it is, Thursday during the month, it's like the first or third or something. When they go to their typical meeting on June 1st, this is the day of the revelation, um, Mark Peterson's not there, and that's not by happenstance. And Dell Stapley's in the hospital, um, sick, and he'll die in August, just two months later. But anyway, it's, it's really about how President Kimball wins these folks over. And he never would have gone and done what he did in, on June 1st, 1978, had he not thought that he had the buy-in from the court. Right. Okay. Thank you for answering that. Um, I think we cover most of the things that you lay out in the overview.
Should we go to the weaknesses and just kind of touch on them one by one? You kind of have them numbered. Is there anything else you want to say about, about kind of that overview before we jump to the weaknesses or exclusions? I, and I know I you talked a bit about those already, but yeah, I don't think so. I will just say one one thing that the, that the church emphasizes in the essay a lot that um, it's this the Book of Mormon uh, verse in Second Nephi, I think, chapter twenty six, that all are likened to God. Right. And um, this would be an interesting study for somebody else to do, um, which is to look at how Latter Day Saints have looked at that verse during the long history of the ban, because you can't look at somebody in the face and say all are likened to God. Um, and then cling to this ban, because that's clearly not the case, right? And some Latter-day Saint apostles caught the uh, incongruity of that Book of Mormon verse, that all are likened to God, um, mostly, except for black people, because they were cursed. And they, they, they caught that theological tension there, and certainly black people caught it. And in the 1940s and 50s, when um, black Latter-day Saints from all over the country and all over the world are writing in the first presidency asking about the ban. They're talking about that scripture. How do you deal with this? How, how do you justify this? You can't tell us that all are alike to God, but then keep us out of the, the liturgical rites of the church. That doesn't sound like all are alike to God. We're, we're treated differently. Why? And that's, that's, that's deeply problematic. And uh, after the revelation in 1978, um, Bruce McConkie gives a a famous uh, address on the revelation called All Are Alike Unto God. And then a year later, Howard W. Hunter um, also gives an address, this time at BYU. And his is also titled All Are Alike Unto God. So they're trying to put flesh and muscle to this Book of Mormon verse that had eluded them for all these years. Yeah. That's emphasized in this. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So... Let's just go through some of the weaknesses or exclusions that you that you note that are uh, missing from the essay. And the first you mention is that there's no apology. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, it's uh, I don't have a lot to say about this other than I guess the question is, why won't the church apologize? And if you talk to some Black Latter-day Saints in the church, I think there's a there's a variety of opinions on that. I mean, some Black Latter-day Saints would argue, I don't need an apology. I just want to go forward and let's just go forward. And then there are some other Black Latter-day Saints who argue that we can't truly heal until we have an apology. And the question then re remains, why can't the church apologize? And um, the, the biggest, the, the, probably the most satisfactory answer I could give is the church is, they're very protective, the apostles, about, um, about what's the right word, about uh, undoing teachings of their predecessors, to, to correct them, to reprove them. They're very careful about that. They don't want to get in the business of reproving their own. And if you apologize for something, you're admitting error. And that's the, really the logical extension of this. If you apologize for something that happened for 126 years, that, that's a huge issue. It's no small thing because so many people were robbed of the rituals of the church, which bind families together for eternity. These, these are no small things. And, um, so to apologize suggests that somehow the leaders had misled the church. And for a number of years, uh, even to the 21st century, there's still this, this idea that, that the brethren cannot lead the church astray. And I think that's, that's problematic because it really sets, it sets the apostles up for failure, really. And in this case, clearly the, the, the brethren had led the church astray with some of these raised teachings. And I just, I just, I know I'm a broken record, but, uh, People are mature enough to handle this. Yes, we said some things that were harmful. We deeply apologize. We want to move forward and make it right. And so what the church does, rather than apologize, what they do is they do a series of, of, of PR uh, moves, which, which is I'm not going to understate the importance of that. And one of the things they'll do is they'll work with the NAACP, which is, which is huge which is great. That's their way of atoning for the past. We're going to work with black organizations. We're going to work with the Wyoming 14. It's been in the Utah newspapers. We're going to donate food to the Wyoming 14 as a group of uh, football players at the University of Wyoming in 1969 um, that were going to protest playing against the BYU football team uh, because of the LDS church's racial policies. And the, the long story short is the Wyoming coach kicked off the team, these players, for protesting. You know, this is not a place to protest. So he kicks them off the team and uh, essentially, you know, cripples their, their college career and ruins some of their NFL prospects. 
And anyway, um, so it was a lot of bitter and acrimony with this. And um, so in, in the interim period, the church has sort of, uh, at least through emissaries, has sort of reached out to these people. There have been some reconciliation moments. The state president of Wyoming was part of this. Darius Gray at one point was part of this. And just recently, um, one of the Wyoming 14 reach out, reached out to Gifford Nielsen, who was um, an LDS general authority today, but also uh, an All-American quarterback at BYU back in the 70s, and also an All-Pro um, quarterback um, in the National Football League. So they worked that football connection, and Gifford Nielsen took it to his superiors and said, look, some of these guys that in Wyoming um, that we played against years ago, they have this food pantry, and they're raising food uh, for disadvantaged families in Wyoming and also the communities in which the Wyoming 14 live. So it was all around the country. It wasn't just Wyoming. And we want the LDS church to contribute. Will you contribute? And through Gifford Nielsen's uh, work with some of the Wyoming 14 members, the church donated a big truckload of goods. I mean, worth, you know, tens of thousands of dollars. So they're doing great things like that. And there, there are, there, there is outreach going on into black communities and so that's what the church is trying to do to atone for the past, is to work with these black organizations without making an apology. I always assumed also that, you know, we obviously have a lot of lawyers running the church. And isn't it just standard legal wisdom that a corporate apology can then, uh, you know, invite litigation and even requests for reparations? And so it's, it's a way to make sure you never have any financial responsibility for anything that goes on. Is that, do you think that is at all influencing Dallin H. Oaks' statement, just kind of his training as a lawyer? Uh, with Mountain Meadows Massacre, definitely yes. With the Wyoming 14, no, there was no statute being broken. It was just good old-fashioned racism. And, um, and I think it for Oaks is, again, Mountain Meadows is different right? Because people lost their lives. This is a different situation. And I think in Oaks's uh, case, he just, he doesn't want to apologize because he, um, he said, quote, the church uh, neither seeks nor gives apologies. And they don't want to get in the business of telling the saints that their predecessors were wrong, that they, they said wrong things or produced policies and doctrines that were hurtful or harmful. They just don't want to go that route. They want to protect their own. And, um, I think that that's deeply, deeply problematic in the church and it, it, the source of unnecessary pain uh, to think that you couldn't apologize. Legally, I guess that's a whole different thing, right? You're protecting yourself from any kind of financial culpability. But to to not do it in the Wyoming or the race issue is, you know, it's really the best way to heal some of the wounds um, in the church with the black community. And, um, and the church won't do it. And maybe one day they will with the right leader. I don't know if there's enough pressure. We'll see. Um, the church is always governed by pressure points. And um, this is something Mike Otterson told me years ago. He said, if enough people in the right places put pressure on, they do listen. And I thought that was really interesting. There was a, a black Latter-day Saint, a very open, a very, what's the right word? A very outspoken black Latter-day Saint man. He was in the Genesis group leadership for a while. And when they had an opening in 2015 in, um, the Quorum of the Twelve, I guess that was the summer when, what, L. Tom Perry died, Boyd Packer and Richard Scott, they all died in succession over a period of a few months. So they had openings in the Twelve. And this um, this this member of the Genesis group, he, he saw Jeff Holland in the hardware store, I think. And he approached Elder Holland, and Elder Holland knew who he was, and he certainly knew who Elder Holland was. And without a filter, he just said, when are you going to put a black person in the Quorum of the Twelve? And Holland didn't give him any, you know, BS. Oh, when the Lord tells us, you know, none of that stuff. Holland gave a very frank response. He said, when we have a bigger black population in the church, we'll consider it. And, um, and of course, that wasn't satisfactory to this, um, this Latter-day Saint man, because his point was, we're losing our black youth, and they need something they can hold on to, somebody in a position of leadership with, for whom they can look up and, um, and Holland, though, it was just the other way around. We'll give you some money, or we'll consider it at least when we get enough black folk. And this Black Latter Saint was saying, well, help us get more black folk by having a black apostle. So the two are speaking past each other. But anyway, um, uh, th these are still sensitive issues today, even as we speak. Sure. 
So the second thing you mentioned as, as being missing besides an apology is no recognition of the pain. And you mentioned, you know, people like Dar Darren Smith and, and Juliana Villegas Haas and others. There are a lot of black Latter-day Saints or ex Latter-day Saints that are like, you got to apologize and you got to recognize the harm and the pain that's been done. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Darren is a, is a good friend of mine. He certainly doesn't speak for a lot of black Latter-day Saints, um, but he's been calling for an apology for a long, long time. And he has, as both a black scholar and a black activist, um, he was friends with a couple of the general authorities. He taught at BYU for a short period, long time ago. So he had a pretty good pedigree. And Darren just pushed a little bit too much for the liking of some in Salt Lake and he ran afoul of that a little bit. And he also, um, when he was, uh, he and his wife were at church, they, they got into trouble with some of their local leaders. Um, I don't think that Darren would mind me saying this because I know he said it publicly, so it's not privileged information, but um, they pushed back on some of these nonsensical racial issues. He and his white wife, then wife, um, who's white, and they were in an interracial marriage and they said some crazy things about interracial marriage in a priest and release society meeting. And Darren and his wife would just speak up and say, look, that's crazy. That's not true. And then the local leadership would push back and, and Darren just recognized it as good old fashioned racism. But the leaders would say, look, there's show me where this is wrong. And the leader had a point at that point. This is in the early two thousands. There was nothing in the church literature that said interracial marriage was, was okay. And that, that didn't happen until 2013 when the document, the race and priesthood essay that we're talking about, um, came out and denounced it. But that's the first time that any authoritative document had denounced interracial marriage. And if we were to push rewind and Darren was in that same um, church meeting, he could say, Bishop, you're wrong. Here's the document. But he didn't have that at the time. He just had his gut and his common sense. And that wasn't good enough for the bishop who was probably, you know, quoting from Bruce McConkie or some other work that was still extant um on lds bookshelves yeah yeah and, and this always brings back you know what people just so often say about this and other issues is the church taught us all what the steps of repentance were it's to you know forsake the sin to apologize to feel remorse to make reparations and i think your your first two points are basically just that the church isn't following doesn't follow its own recommended steps for repentance. Is that fair to say? That's true, but let me add one more quick nuance to it. So I was talking to a former BYU religion dean a few years ago and um, who's friends with at least half the Quorum of the Twelve. And I asked this religion dean very just point blank. I said, why don't they apologize? What's going on? And uh, clearly there's racism all over the place in the church today. And he said, some of the brethren don't think there is. And I said, who? And he said, Dallin Oaks and Boyd Packer. And I, all I said was that is, that is terribly disappointing because if, if somehow word is not getting back to them, um, I, 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 well, I don't know, maybe, maybe it is. And they're just like this, but um, it's possible that they're just not hearing the stories that's going on at the local level, because there is a disconnect sometimes between church headquarters and what's going on in the units of the church. And this is one of the reasons why they have a Genesis group. It's a, it's, it really is a black support group. And so when they have issues of race, they would that around the country, people would contact the Genesis leadership in Salt Lake. And there is a general authority that at the lower level, it usually it's a 70 that oversees the Genesis group. And um, clearly that 70 would know about these racial tensions. But whether that makes it up to the channels to someone like Boyd Packer, or a senior apostle, I mean, I don't know. But um, but that's what the religion dean said. He said, I, I've talked to Packer about this. I've talked to Oaks about this. They don't see that there's a problem. And if there's not a problem, why do you apologize? Right. Okay. A third thing that you mentioned is that it doesn't acknowledge, you know, the, the doctrinal status of, of these positions historically. I think we've talked about that quite a bit. Is there anything else you want to say about that or? I don't think so. Um, well, one quick thing that there, there's a trajectory about how the church has characterized its racial teachings over time. And I did a book in 2015 that talks about this in great detail, uh, Blacks and Mormons. I did it with Newell Bringhurst. And um, we talked about in this book how 
it became, you know, the doctrine of the church. Then it moved into, we don't know why this is in 1969. We don't know why the ban occurred, which is a terrible decision. You know, it's the context is important. It's a civil rights movement. They're trying to get people off their backs. We don't know why. Right. Well, Bruce McConkie would never agree with that. Right. We do know why read, read Mormon doctrine. It tells you why blacks can't have the priesthood. So this whole, we don't know why position was really nonsensical. Um, so it goes from doctrine to we don't know why. And then in the uh, early 20, for late 1990s, early 21st century, you again get a, a new position, which is um, it's the opinions of just earlier leaders. They were just speaking on their own, just a few of them. You get that line. And then fourthly and final, you get folklore. It's folklore. And um, so there's this evolutionary view of how the church has characterized its racial teachings over time. And then I guess, I guess to bookend it here, the fifth po position would be with, in 2013 where they denounce all of this stuff, and uh, which, is, which is good. But um, um, it takes, it's a process that, that they have to arrive at to get there. And they didn't want to create these essays overnight. I mean, we, 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 you and I spent a long time this morning talking about the genesis of these LDS gospel topics essays, but each of the essays can be said to have its own life. And the Black and Priesthood essay, one of the major impetuses of this, this essay was um, two things, one long-term, one short-term. The long-term was you get Black Latter-day Saints writing in, they're struggling with LDS racial teachings. And um, they want to know that they're not cursed. And the brethren write back, Gordon Hinckley writes back to a brother in, a black brother in California. He says, um, we're not racist. And he writes back, that's, that's not what I'm asking. What I'm, a, I, what I'm asking is denounce the curse, denounce this less valiant stuff. And Hinckley won't do it. He just wants to focus on the church doesn't believe in racism. And so uh, President Hinckley is moving the goalposts on this guy. He's, he recognizes it. And he's upset. Anyway, so this is all done in private. And then the short-term thing that leads to the race and priesthood essay is, is of course, the Randy Bott debacle, a BYU religion professor who gave this explosive interview with Washington, Washington Post reporter Jason Horowitz in 2012 during the midst of the Mitt Romney campaign. And the church was all presidential campaign. And the church was already on high alert that the media, the national media, was going to come after the church on race and polygamy. And they were ready for it. They produced some promotional videos. They had uh, Darius Gray do a promotional video as a Black Latter-day Saint bearing his testimony about the church. And so they're trying to put it all in the best possible light. And here you have a, um, a BYU professor who undermines all of this by giving this, this interview. And um, in the Horowitz was there just to get an interview about the, some of the church's teachings. And he was just trying to find anybody who would talk to him. And um, have I talked to you about this, uh, John, before? No, go ahead. Okay, I don't want to repeat it if I have, but I know in another podcast, one of the I've done a lot of podcasts, but I've explained this on another podcast. But um, so Horowitz is in town. I interviewed Horowitz, and so I've gotten his version of all of this. And um, so Horowitz is in town, Provo, and he doesn't go through the administration like he. I think he didn't know that he had to. Um, he just started going over to the religion building and knocking on doors, and. Every door that he opened, the professor would say, he would say, I'm Jason Horowitz, Washington Post. I want to do a story on Mitt Romney. And just can you answer some questions about the church? And the BYU, the, the religion professors, no, no, we're not authorized to do this. You haven't gone through the channels. Okay. Keeps knocking. And th so they know that this is all on high alert. They, the BYU professors have been told, do not reach out to the media unless it's been approved by us. We just have to very, be very careful about this. Anyway, after the umpteenth door Horowitz knocks on, old Randy Bott opens up. And, oh, come on in. <laughs> I guess he missed the memo that he shouldn't have done that. But he did that. And they were talking just nonchalantly about the church's teachings, just from a variety of issues they covered. And then it got to race. And Bott just started talking about that black people were cursed and they couldn't hold the priesthood because they were less valiant. And it was like... Uh, given the keys to a little child, you wouldn't give the keys to a child to drive a car because they're a child. It's the same with the priesthood. Why would you allow blacks to the priesthood? They're like children. I mean, it was the most insulting, demeaning thing. And I asked Horowitz, I said, when you heard this, what did you think? He's like, oh my God, I knew I had a story. 
And so <laughs> he he um, he recognized intuitively that wow, there, there's a story here. And that, but that wasn't what he was asking for. He wasn't seeking that. He knew very little about Mormon racial teaching. He didn't even know enough to ask about the ban. He didn't know there was a ban. And so Hor that uh, Bot just talked freely and frankly with the Post reporter. And of course, Horowitz is good at what he does, and he recognized, oh wow, my readers are going to want to hear this. So the very next day, boom. The story breaks, and it's 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 it focuses on the race stuff, not exclusively, but but it does talk about race, and the church, of course, is now in full damage control. They've worked so hard to cultivate a relationship with the media um, for Mitt Romney, this high-profile Latter-day Saint, and now it's being undermined by a BYU religion professor, and. Um, so the church produced two statements denouncing the BYU professor. I mean, this is extraordinary. They, 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 they say his name in the statement. BYU professor does not speak for the church. And they give the implication that old Randy Bott has gone rogue, which really kind of upsets me a little bit, uh, actually a lot. Um, and far be it for me to defend Randy Bott because I <laughs> never defend the racist stuff that he, this, he spewed that day. But basically, they, they give the impression that he's gone rogue. And just think about that for a moment. It doesn't pass the smell test. You've got a BYU religion professor going rogue? Really? No, not even close. What he's doing is he's just promoting teachings that he thought were normal and orthodox. The church had never repudiated any of this stuff. And so he just simply thought that he was quoting from the 1969 statement, the 1949 statement, Bruce McConkie, and all these other things where he read about and learned about the race teachings, the race doctrine. And then I'm sure, I don't know this because I haven't interviewed Bob, but I'm sure the guy must have had a heart attack when the church threw him under a bus because here he thought he was teaching the doctrines of the church. And really, in effect, what these two PR releases said was, you're teaching false doctrine. And that was really, really terribly unfair to Randy Bott to make a spectacle of him uh, regarding that when they hadn't gone on record prior to that to denounce the ban. Now, if this happened after 2013, um, when the Relation and Priesthood essay was released, in which it categorically denounces or condemns um, the curse and the less valiant stuff, and he continued to teach it, now he's going rogue or he's ignorant. But that didn't happen. And um, th there's some more I can say about this, but there's... Uh, I, I, Box, Bot said he was misquoted. The Washington Post misquoted him. Unfortunately, that's just not true. Horowitz tape recorded the whole thing. And also, um, I found on Bot's webpage a screenshot where he taught the same things um, in, in CES seminars and his BYU classes. So there's plenty of evidence. And then finally, the BYU religion dean, with whom I mentioned a minute, referred to a minute ago, I asked him about bot too. And he said, Oh, we knew this was a problem. We told Randy to tone it down. That's what he said. Tone it down. And Randy didn't tone it down. And uh, so it cost him big time. And obviously when that broke in the spring of 2012, um, bot went into immediate retirement and as a PR move, you know, his retirement was planned. I don't know if anyone on planet earth believes that. <laughs> so It's like Paulie's done. I mean, yeah, we know how that works. So he went into immediate retirement. And they sent him on a mission to um, Iran. No, just kidding. <laughs> um, you, you talk about Joseph Fielding Smith, and uh, you've already mentioned the way to perfection. By the way, so I read Doctrines of Salvation 1, 2, and 3 on my mission. You know, obviously I grew up with Mormon doctrine. I've never heard of the way to perfection. And I was just stunned at this quote that comes, you know, at the bottom of your paragraph on page 251. Um, you said he declares that Cain, do you want me to read it? Sure. He declares, this is Joseph Fielding Smith, declares that Cain, quote, became the father of an inferior race. I, Those, those are pretty harsh words. From from a prophet here and revelator, right? I don't know if he was a, a apostle at the time he wrote that, but he was. Yeah, he's referring to the pe people of color as an inferior race. That's that's language I wasn't familiar with. That's kind of hardcore. Well, if you continue reading, um, let's see. Um, later in the essay, uh, 
he says that he never said that. And um, I, I write this in the, where is it? It's somewhere here. He talks about them in 1930. He writes that black people are there are an inferior race. And then let's see. And there's also the quote emblematic emblematical of eternal darkness. They're emblematical of eternal darkness. <laughs> yeah. And then um awful. On, oh, it's it really it's tough. On 252, the very next page, he writes in the doctrines of salvation that the Latter-day Saints have no animosity towards the Negro. Which is very nice. Isn't that very nice? Neither have they described him as belonging to an inferior race. Now, all right, let's just pause for a moment. So in 1930, um, Joseph Fielding Smith, Apostle Smith, says that black people are emblematical of eternal darkness and they are the father of an inferior race. And, uh, and then that's in, the, that's in the 1930 book, The Way to Perfection. And then in the Doctrines of Salvation... In the 1950s, so two decades later, he says, no, we've never said that. Well, <laughs> the problem is, you did. And it's written down and published. Now, why would he do that? And, you know, this is the importance of history, I think, is the context. And when he wrote the Doctrines of Salvation, the church is coming under heavy fire for its racial teachings during the civil rights movement. And... Um, he says this in Doctrines of Salvation. He'll deny that he ever said that black people were an inferior race or from an inferior race. And then he'll say it again in 1962 um, uh, that black, that, that I've never said that. And in 1962, George Romney's running for the presidency, or at least he's considering it. And so, of course, people are, they're, um, their critics, journalists, and others are looking at the church's racial teachings. And George Romney, how could you belong to a church that's racist and, and all of this stuff? And, and um, anyway, so that's the context in which Joseph Fielding Smith denies it. He said, I've, I've never said that because he's, he's backtracking. Well, the problem is he said it. And I know this sounds harsh to readers, but in the 1920s and 30s, this, was, this wouldn't have turned heads. I mean, there were a lot of people who really thought that black people were from a different species. It's crazy to think about this. And this is radical stuff. But this is a, a, a generation of Americans who believe in eugenics. Who um, This is a generation of Americans who are promoting these interracial marriage laws so that you wouldn't pollute the bloodstreams. This is a generation of Americans who are lynching black people on the tune of like 2,000 people a week for decades. It's um, so even the church itself participates in this terrible discourse. If you look at the improvement era from the 1910s and 20s, I have a whole chapter on this in my book. And some of the stuff that they're publishing in the improvement era is just it really is it's beyond the pale. But but it reminds me of the generation in which this is occurring. They're talking about uh, I didn't want to say it, but they're publishing poems using the N word, um, the N baby the n-word and um they're making fun of black people uncle sam and and black people are they don't wear shoes and they smell and they eat chicken all the time i mean they're playing off of these these racial tropes that you would see in the motion picture industry and also in magazines and so mormons are following lock stock and barrel the the broader american society and making fun of um uh, black culture and black people and um they're telling racist jokes all over the place in um, the improvement era. There's a little segment in the improvement era. This is the church magazine before the end sign. And the improvement era had a section they ran for a number of years called the funny bone. And in the funny bone, they had a series of, of uh, just jokes that they would tell. And a number of those jokes dealt with people of color, making fun of their skin color, making fun of them, their, their facial features and all of that stuff. And so the church is participating in this harmful discourse. So it doesn't surprise me in the least bit that Joseph Fielding's doing this in 1930. And nor does it surprise me that by the 40, by the 50s and 60s, he's completely backing off of this stuff because it's so terribly offensive. And the civil rights movement and some of these provocateurs in the movement are pointing this out to the church. And let me say one last thing um, about this. There's a couple of instances. There's actually several instances where the church knows that it's coming under assault for its racial teachings. Let me just give you a few. Um, one is 
in the 1960s, uh, there is a BYU professor named James Clark who publishes a multi-volume account called Messages of the First Presidency. And he wants to include um, the 1949 First Presidency Statement on Race in this, this volume he's doing. He's gotten permission from the apostles to do this. But Joseph Fielding Smith, of all people, tells him, no, don't include that one. Don't do that. Leave that one out. And this is in the 1965. And so uh, even Joseph Fielding Smith was very aware that if you put this obscure 1949 statement in your book, Latter-day Saints will be able to read this. And therefore, other people outside of the church will be able to read it. We don't want that. Uh, also, they published The Way to Perfection. It went through multiple editions. Um, it was really one of the best-selling books in Mormonism. And it was part of a lesson manual series in the 30s and 40s. So it was really a popular book. And in Brazil, when they uh, translated into Portuguese, they had omitted the two chapters that deal with race. I mean, this is the emblematical of eternal darkness chapter, the black people are the father of an inferior race chapter. Uh, chapters 15 and 16, they left those out. They purposely did not translate those into Portuguese. This is in the mid 60s again, because they're afraid of the effect that it would have on Brazilian Latter-day Saints. And then finally, in 1968, at the apex of the civil rights movement, the first presidency, had this, they have this meeting in April of 1968. And in the meeting, um, David O. McKay is there and his counselors. They decide that they shouldn't talk about black people being cursed or less valiant in public discourse. And um, the reason is, they said, if whatever we talk about black people, let's make it, quote, clear, positive and brief, end quote. And the reason why they wanted it clear, positive, and brief is because it wasn't doing them any good to try to explain to an outsider why they thought black people were less valiant or cursed. It just made no sense. It, it made it worse. So let's just sort of sidestep it. And then it's about that time where you get this, this silly notion that we don't know why they couldn't hold the priesthood. And so it was all a direct response to some of the context of the time. And I'll, I'll say one last thing is, uh, that I mentioned in the Ezra Taft Benson podcast, but it bears repeating, that Benson in the mid-60s tries to run for the U.S. presidency with two extremely controversial men, uh, the first of whom was Strom Thurmond, a segregationist senator from South Carolina, and the second of whom was a uh, segregationist governor from Alabama, a guy named George Wallace. And David O. McKay... Um, uh, having a high, a senior uh, apostle run as a presidential platform with two of the most high profile segregationists of the day, that wasn't going to be a good look for the church. And President uh, McKay said something very clear. He said, we've been taking constant pot shots from our own people. That's his language, constant pot shots from our own people over race. This is in the 1960s. And if we have Benson run with Wallace or Thurman, it'll even be more so. And with Wallace in particular, the Ku Klux Klan, the White Citizens Council, and of course the John Birch Society were the supporters. And so to have an LDS apostle run on a presidential ticket that was supported by the Klan and also the White Citizens Council, an equally white supremacist group, that would be deeply problematic for the church's racial teachings. So anyway, they're well aware of the 1960s of what's going on. And this is where you get the 1960s, John. Um, where you get the church backtracking uh, quite a bit from its previous racial teachings. And you'll find that the way to perfection is, is starting to sort of be de-emphasized. It wasn't the go-to book on race that it once was in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. By the 1960s, it was sort of the book that nobody wanted to talk about. And, um, and then, of course, you know, Mormon doctrine then replaces it and uh, carries on this anti-Black view. Right. That's a, that's fascinating history. Thank you for sharing. And if I had to summarize what I think you're saying, both by mentioning Joseph Fielding Smith and Bruce R. McConkie on page 253, you seem to be saying that the essay doesn't, the, the, the race in the priesthood essay doesn't accurately take responsibility and treat uh, prior statements by both Joseph Fielding Smith and Bruce R. McConkie. Is that a fair summary? Yeah, there's no question that they, it's, it, it really just cherry picks about this message. It's trying to send a message that all are inclusive, all are alike unto God. And it's problematic when you've got Mormon doctrine and, and some of the writings that are still on LDS bookshelves at the time. Even to this day, doctrine of salvation is still in print. And, excuse me, why that's the case is just, I, I, 
Um, anyway, it's still in print and it shouldn't be, but it is. And I know that there are some good Latter-day Saints who've been working diligently for a long time to remove racist uh, books from the bookshelves sold at Desert Book. And uh, they were successful. There was a bunch of people who lobbied for Mormon doctrine to end. This is part of the story I can't share. At least I'm not authorized to publicly, but there was a backstory to Mormon doctrine. Um, there's a backstory to uh, the way to perfection getting pulled in 1986. There was a backstory to the Kindle version getting pulled in 2018. And I know firsthand that there's a backstory to get doctrines of salvation out of print, off the shelves. And as far as I know, it's still in print. So clearly it hasn't been successful yet. But, you know, if you're a Latter-day Saint, and especially if you're new in the church, you can go to an LDS bookstore and you can buy doctrines of salvation or order it online, Amazon. And you can get it at home and you think that it's authorized because the still, church still uh, prints it. And then, of course, you go to this stuff and you start learning about the curse and Cain and all that nonsense. And you you think that if you didn't know better, you'd, you'd still think it's the teaching of the church when obviously it's not. So um, th there's still a, that, that racial residue that's still there. And, and also some manuals, church manuals, especially some manuals from the early 80s, uh, deal with this idea of of priesthood hierarchies, that certain people got the priesthood at certain times. You, you get that implication. And of course, the implication of that Black people had to wait their time. And that stuff needs to be cleaned up. Um, it might already be cleaned up, but as of a couple of years ago, they were still using some of this old stuff. And I was told, I've asked just several, several occasions, why does the church still have this stuff? This is really, you know, and they just said, you know, I got a very honest response. Um, it just takes time. You know, it takes time to put pe these things together and have people rewrite these manuals. And and then some people on the church correlation committee who do work on these manuals, they're they're tone deaf. I mean, they don't understand how problematic some of this is. And we saw this a year or two ago when they uh, promoted a lesson plan or published a lesson. And um, they were using stuff from Joseph Fielding Smith, who in some of his book uh, stuff from The Way to Perfection and the Doctrines of Salvation. They were using this in this new LDS lesson manual, and it dealt with race. Oh, my goodness, really? Of all the people you're going to quote on race, it's going to be Joseph Fielding Smith? Well, one of the apostles apologized about it publicly to the NAACP. Of all places to apologize to it, um, he didn't have to do it there. And I'm sure the NAACP had no idea what's going on, you know. But that was the backstory, that people had complained about this new manual that was quoting Joseph Fielding Smith. And uh, the apostle, I um, can't remember who it was. Might have been Quentin Cook. I don't recall. But the apostle went on record and apologized to the NAACP. This is just a couple of years ago. So uh, there are some people in the high church leadership who just don't have a, you know, a sensitivity to some of this, this challenge. And if they haven't dealt with it directly, they might not know about it. Right. Okay, really quickly, one of our listeners, Mike Anderson, asks, did Matt teach political science at Dixie 15 years ago? Was that you? Yes, that was me. Were you in my class? <laughs> it must have been. 20 so years. So Mike Anderson, same guy. He says you were great. Oh, thank you. <laughs> appreciate that. I taught American history, uh, American civilizations, it was called. And also I taught a couple of sections of American government. Nice. Uh, All right. Yeah. Well, shout out to Matt and Mike. And thanks for your donation, Mike. Uh, you guys on YouTube, uh, there's a feature for you guys to be able to donate to the podcast. And Mike... Mike donated to be able to have his question be prioritized. Thanks, Mike, for that support. Right on. Um, all right, Matt. A, a next major problem that you talk about in with the uh, race and the priesthood essay is the fact that the 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 founding scripture that that provides much of the basis for Mormon racist teachings around skin color and worthiness and all that remains unchanged to this day. And I'm specifically speaking about both the Book of Mormon. And, uh, you know, the Pearl of Great Price, which includes both the Book of Moses and the Book of Abraham. Do you want to just give us a quick primer on how uh, the scriptures remain super racist? Hmm. All right. So here's the big elephant in the room, right? We haven't talked about. This is like the drum roll. This is the, the essence of my essay, really, um, which is this is the elephant in the room that the race and priesthood essay didn't talk about is the racialist implications of Mormon scripture, both in the Book of Mormon and in the Pearl of Great Price, in particular, the Book of Abraham. And um, the Book of Mormon is an interesting text. It's produced by Joseph Smith in 1830. 
And uh, um, it, it certainly, there's been a lot of scholarship on the historicity of the Book of Mormon, whether you're a believer or not. If you're a believer, of course, it's an ancient text that was revealed to the prophet through angels. And if you're not a believer, but yet you still find the book is a wonderful expression of Christology, then you can think that it's a 19th century frontier text that has much good in it, but you reject the divine authenticity of it. And if you're a real skeptic like Mark Twain, it was just chloroform and print. It, uh, <laughs> it didn't really have much good to say about anything. It was poorly written. It was poorly constructed. It was a poor man's version of the Bible. And I think in recent years, Latter-day Saints have, I shouldn't say in recent years, but for a long time, Latter-day Saint scholars have been uh, in really engaged in, in heavy debate about the authenticity of the Book of Mormon. And do we have to say it's an ancient text? Uh, come on, Hugh Nibley, we can, we can still move the church forward and not believe that an angel gave this book to a, you know, a farmer, farmer's son in upstate New York. We, we can still work without that. That's just a narrative that's not sustainable. And of course, Nibley didn't believe that and spent his entire career trying to locate this, um, this scripture in its, its ancient um, authentic background, whereas linguists and others are, are trying to place it in its 19th century cultural milieu. Well, having said that, um, there's, a, there's a lot of stuff going on in the 19th century with Protestants, and there's been lots written about how Protestant theology has influenced the Book of Mormon. One of my uh, great teachers at BYU back in the day was a guy named Tom Alexander, who wrote a wonderful essay for Sunstone in 1980, um, a long time ago, in which he talked about um, the Protestant influence on Mormon theology. And what he meant by that was that a lot of these Latter-day Saints are uh, are coming to the church, they're, they're converting to the church, and they're bringing their Protestant backgrounds with them. I mean, not surprisingly. And so there's this eclectic mix of Protestant theology with this new revealed theology from the prophet Joseph Smith. Anyway, um, part of this is race, that Mormons have inherited these uh, notions of race, and particularly that somehow through righteous living and moral probity and um, accepting Jesus's divine grace, as to borrow a Protestant term, that your skin color could eventually lighten and ultimately fade away. And what that means is, it's obviously it means there's a racial fluidity, that, that you, you were white at one point, that somehow you've done something to merit God's disfavor. So he cursed you with a uh, black or brown skin, but you could remove that curse if you found God's light. And that is very much a Protestant trope. And uh, Mormons will accept this trope uncritically, and it finds its way into the Book of Mormon, and it deals with Native Americans. And I, I'm sure most of your readers know these passages of Scripture throughout the Book of Mormon, in which the Lamanites bear the mark of a curse, and uh, through they become exceedingly white and delightsome as they repent of their sins, and. Um, the church has for a long time, or at least some of the apologists in the church, has taught that this is all figurative speaking. It means your soul, your spirit, and all of that stuff. And that's fine. I mean, if you want to read that into that, that's, that's just fine. But there's a reader reception theory out there that suggests that that's not how Latter-day Saints interpreted this stuff. Both black and brown people, well into the 20th century. They didn't believe any of that stuff. That It just meant your soul. That's not how they interpreted it. And they were deeply bothered by this, that if you were black and brown, somebody of color, and you uh, you bore a, a, a curse, if you will, which is what your church taught, that somehow that curse could be removed. And the apostles couldn't decide for themselves, at least the ones who bought into this. Not all of them did, by the way. But the, the ones who did, they couldn't decide uh, if the curse would be removed completely in mortality or if it would be removed ultimately in the resurrection. There was, there was some discussion about this. In 1944, um, a Latter-day Saint uh, wrote about this. He wrote to the First Presidency, and he wanted to know, what color will black people, Negroes, be in the resurrection? What's the church doctrine on this? And I talk about this in my book. The church, uh, <laughs> the First Presidency wrote him back, and they said, we have no official doctrine on this. And so... But you do have these racial, these lingering racial tropes from the 19th century that dealt with Native Americans. 
But uh, black people, black Latter-day Saints, will read into those racial tropes as they investigate the church, and they want to know how these, these, these racialist verses apply to them. It's very real to them. And I might add that in LDS literature, well into the 20th century, probably into the 1930s, um, as I document in my book, there are all kinds of, of articles that are being written in the improvement era and other church-sponsored literature talking about um, experiences that general authorities had with Native Americans or Lamanites on reservations and converting them to the gospel and their skin color was turning lighter or the ones who didn't convert, they still had dark skin. I mean, you're getting this all over the place. And, um, and Protestants believe this too. So it's not just a Mormon thing. And so uh, by the 1950s and 60s, um, well, let me back up. Uh, they don't talk about uh, in the Enzyme or other places, the improvement era, the, how that applies to black people, because they're already under fire by the civil rights movement for some of their teachings about blacks. So the black stuff is just subterranean. It's just it's 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 talked about only in private. And there's a there's a group of uh, church education system teachers and uh, they met up with uh, Joseph Fielding Smith, the church's chief doctrinal uh, expositor at the time, and also a senior apostle. They met up with Joseph Fielding Smith and Mark E. Peterson after Mark E. Peterson had given this very controversial um, address on race at BYU. And this is in the August of 1954. And this is just a few months after the historic Brown versus the Board Supreme Court decision. And so these educators had questions about Elder Peterson's address. And um, they asked about segregation. They asked about all kinds of things. Well, this is off the record. And Hugh Nibley's there, uh, Sidney Sperry's there, Lowell Benyon's there, Paul Dunn's there. It's the who's who of the church education system in 1954. Uh, a guy named T. Edgar Lyons there, George Boyd is there, the brother-in-law uh, to Spencer W. Kimball, who teaches in the CS system. So anyway, um, they're all there. And uh, uh, Sidney Sperry, the so-called Old Testament scholar at BYU, uh, taught there for a number of years until he retired, I think, in the early 1970s. But he he asked Joseph Fielding Smith, he said, tell us about black people and the curse. Is it true that black people, they didn't use black, it was, it was Negro. Is it true that Negroes uh, would lose their skin color over time? And Joseph Fielding Smith looked at Sidney Sperry and he said, quote, we have actual examples of Negro skin color turning after they converted. So I, I don't know how you interpret that figuratively. We have actual examples. And so he didn't talk about, you know, those examples and who he met. It would have been interesting if Perry would have asked a follow-up. Hey, tell me who you're talking about. I want to see the before and after pictures. But um, anyway, he didn't do that. And and so that's, uh, but that's not surprising because Joseph Fielding Smith had been talking in his writings for a number of years about the dark skin of Lamanites, the cursed skin of Lamanites turning lighter over time. And clearly, um, I want to emphasize to your listeners that just as black people have been offended with this sort of racialized uh, uh, discourse, uh, our brothers and sisters of Native American ancestry have also been deeply affected by this. And um, Native American Latter-day Saints growing up thinking that they too have experienced a racial fluidity. And if they were only more righteous, their skin color would turn lighter. I mean, how deeply offensive that is. So, uh, but this was done uh, sub Rosa mostly in the 50s and 60s with black people. And if you talk to any black or brown Latter-day Saint who's been in the church for a number of years, they will tell you that they have heard this many times over the years. That um, And of course, you know, they laugh it off. Some of them do. And some of them just like roll their eyebrows and, and, and don't want to talk about it. But this kind of discourse goes on well into the early 21st century. And it's not something you're hearing in general conference. These are sort of, you know, shards of, of Joseph Fielding Smith's generation that keeps you know, going forward. And and I, I want to be clear, I think people who know me now know that I don't treat general authorities as a monolith. Spencer Kimball would never, ever think this about Black people. He did about Native Americans, but he never said that about Black people, they would lose their curse or skin. There's no evidence for it, even though he said it about Native Americans. David O. McKay didn't believe this stuff, but certainly Bruce McConkie did, certainly Joseph Fielding Smith did, and there were some other, you know, uh, hardline general authorities who did. But not all of the general authorities believe this. And by 1978, when the revelation occurred, uh, just after the revelation occurred, uh, lifting the priesthood ban, Joseph, uh, Spencer Kimball told 
um, the apostles, he said, make sure we're not teaching this. We don't, we don't want to teach this, that, that your skin color will turn lighter over time. So this is one of those really embarrassing teachings that the church had inherited from uh, Protestant theology, uh, Protestant theologians, and they never had really examined this, you know, critically. And, um, and unfortunately, people like Randy Bott and some other, uh, I'm going to be very careful on this, uh, people like Randy Bott and a couple of other hardliners who taught at the BYU religion department, um, not all, certainly not all, but they were teaching some of this stuff well into the 21st century. And I've documented all of that in this book. But this is this is going on in Mormon circles for a long time. And the reason why the church didn't address this in the Raced and Priesthood essay is because it's problematic. There are people today who are calling for uh, these racialist verses in the Book of Mormon or the Book of Abraham to be expunged, to be purged. And uh, Spencer Kimball's done a little bit about it. Um, in the essay, I, I talk about how in 1978, um, they get rid of some of the language in the Book of Mormon. They tone it down. And they do it again in the 21st century when they produce a commercialized version of the Book of Mormon for Doubleday, a significant um, publishing house, commercial publishing house. So they have there have been, a, you know, attempts uh, to deal with these racial tropes. Um, in the temple in 1969, they had sought a, uh, a dark-skinned Tongan to play the devil in the temple ceremony. And, and um, obviously, dark skin representing sin. And as a proud Tongan, when he, you know, this person recognized that he was being recruited to play the devil in the temple ceremony because of his dark skin, he was mortified. He's like, out! I'm not doing this. And, of course, they wanted a Caucasian to play Jesus. And uh, the, the, let's not lose try, sight of the fact of what these racial tropes represent. And so the Tongan was upset, and they settled on... Um, <laughs> A, uh, to play Satan, they settled on a, a BYU uh, religion professor named Spencer Palmer, who taught world religions at BYU for a number of years. And he's the one that talked about how he got that role of playing Satan in the temple ceremony. And for your listeners, I don't want to go deeply in the temple ceremony because it's it's kind of sacred to Latter-day Saints. Um, but Latter-day Saints had what are called live endowment sessions in the temple in which they recreate the Genesis story in the Bible and Adam and Eve, for example. And so um, today it's all digitized. You can watch it on film and all that stuff. But back in those days, they had live actors playing Adam and Eve and Satan. And so that's why they chose someone with dark skin, this Tongan, to play Satan in 1969. And when he found out why they chose him, <laughs> he was upset. And uh, they chose Spencer Palmer, the BYU religion professor, who's very light skinned. And, and so he played Satan. Um, so the and by 1990, uh, the church had changed its temple ceremony, um, and they didn't want to give the impression that Satan was sort of black-skinned, because that had just these terrible connotations about what black skin meant, that it's somehow aligned with uh, Satan. And that's, so the church has, has done, made some inroads with these kinds of things over the years, but unfortunately, they didn't take that last final step and address this in um, in 2013, because the Book of Mormon, it's really, it's got a bifurcated message, if you will, for people of color. On the one hand, you've got these horrible racial, racial tropes about curses and racial fluidity. And on the other hand, you've got this remarkable verse that talks about racial inclusivity, that all are alike unto God. And these two, these two racial tropes from different ends of the spectrum, they're at odds with each other. And in an ideal world, the church would go through in my view, in an ideal world, they would um, expurgate these racist verses and get rid of them and uh, make the, the scriptures a little bit more modern for the 21st century. And if they couldn't do that, because they have to get rid of quite a few, it's not just a few things here and there, it's, it's, it's pretty significant. Um, but in the absence of doing that, at least contextualize the verses and talk about what they mean. The, the Latter-day Saints and, and church leaders have unfortunately um, uh, been offended by these verses and how they receive these verses and how they were taught. But we just don't have that, that discourse because unfortunately the church leaders don't want to go there. Oh, you're on mute. Uh, my first response was going to be, yeah, because they can't change scripture because that's scripture. But then there, there, there was, they did update the book of Mormon as you write, 
and they took out some of the white and delightsome language, yeah. but not all of it. And so I guess that begs two questions. If they were going to go to the trouble of cleaning out some of that white and delightsome language in the Book of Mormon, why didn't they go all the way? And then secondly, if they can make that change then, then I guess they could make that change now. Well, well what am I missing? That would be a logical response, um, you, you know, from from maybe our sensibilities, John, and, and that of others listening and elsewhere in the church. Um, let's make the scriptures inviting for the 21st century. And there's, in my opinion, there's always going to be an issue with race in the church as long as those verses remain. I mean, it's a shibboleth. They need to go. And um, they're a holdup. I can't tell you how many black uh, Latter-day Saints I've talked to and also read about that when they're investigating the church and they're reading the Book of Mormon, which is what, of course, the uh, missionaries want them to do, they come across these racialized verses. And, you know, I had one Latter-day Saint tell me, one Latter-day scholar uh, for whom I respect, but, well, that just applies to Native Americans. And I'm thinking, think about this, what you're saying for a moment. Yes, it does. You're right. It doesn't mention people of, of black African ancestry anywhere in the Book of Mormon. But, but think about this. Black people are reading this. Don't you think they're going to, to ask how it applies to them? And they do. And that's in this essay that I wrote. I've got just example after example after example of um, Latter-day Saints in the 40s, 50s, and 60s who are black Latter-day Saints who are extremely upset with the way the church has racialized them through scripture and, um, and how Latter-day Saints have racialized themselves. And uh, so it's... Uh, you know, I, I guess it's one thing to make some changes at the margins um, in the Book of Mormon, and it's quite another to really to take out wholesale verses. And that's what would have to happen, just to be honest, um, if they were to remove these. I haven't counted them up, but there's quite a few of them. And President Kimball, when he made some of his changes or authorized these changes in the um, 1981 edition of the scriptures, um, you know, one of the changes they made was they changed, they went from... Um, they took out white and delights into pure and delights them. And they had a rationale for it. The rationale was that um, the original edition of the Book of Mormon said pure and delights them. And somehow white and delights them got worked into it. So they wanted to revert back to the original translation from 1830. And a Royal Scouse and a BYU linguistics professor has done some great work with some of the early texts of the Book of Mormon. And anyway... Um, so that was the rationale for that. But the other stuff, it really cuts at the, the, the heart of the narrative of the Book of Mormon, because it's really a story about redemption. And part of that redemption is racial redemption. In order to be saved, you've got to shed your curse, your skin. And then God will find favor uh, with you again by blessing you with whiteness. And um, I don't know how you deal with that without really um, altering some of the foundation of the Book of Mormon. And I think that's that's why they didn't address it in the race and priesthood essay. It's really hard to deal with. And that's why um, some of the church apologists have who worked for farms, for example, all these years, they would they would address these issues in their writings and they would always talk about, well, it meant the spiritual implications of your soul. And this is and they would find some far-fetched connection to the ancient world. Just as they did in ancient Rome, so would they would do well, that's fine. Maybe that's true. Maybe there were some uh, uh, spiritual ramifications for, for skin and curses back in the day, but it doesn't change the fact that, that church leaders in Latter-day Saints had interpreted these in a very literal fashion. They taught them in literal fashion. And um, a story, a quick story. Um, years ago, I was interviewing a uh, Ed Kimball, uh, President Kimball's son, and I was interviewing him because I wanted to get access to his father's papers. So in, in preparation for the book I'm doing now, and I asked Ed about this. I said, um, I said, your father gave this very controversial general conference talk in, I think, 1960 is when it was, and it was about Lamanites. And he basically said that, uh, I'm going to paraphrase, but he said that we, and this is also in my book here, but he said that... Um, uh, I said, your father, I would imagine he received a lot of pushback for this. And the talk was about how Spencer Kimball taught. He was part of the, um, the apostle who was responsible for the Indian placement program. And Lamanites um, or Native Americans had a special place in Elder Kimball's heart. And he wanted to get some of these folks off of the reservations and into Latter-day State homes where they could receive better nurturing in the gospel where they could receive better educational opportunities. 
And in that controversial 1960 General Conference talk, uh, Elder Kimball held up a picture, literally a picture. He showed the, the saints who were listening and watching that these are the Latter-day Saints who have left the reservation and um, have are living in Latter-day Saint homes. You can see how their skin is lighter. Then he showed a picture of some of the ones who remain behind on the reservations, and their skin was darker. I mean, he's calling out this just a position here in conference. It, it's really an extraordinary moment. And uh, Ed Kimball told me that his father was embarrassed by that, didn't expect the, the feedback. I mean, Latter-day Saints are not a quiet group. In those days, they didn't have email, of course, but they just write letters, and they wrote them letters. And some some were merely quizzical. You know, what, what did you mean by that? That just seems awkward that you would lose your skin color, your pigment, when you you, you left a, a geographic area and went somewhere else. That, that just seems bizarre. And then, of course, the other side of the coin was, that's just crazy talk. Come on, Elder Kimball. And he wasn't prepared for the harsh letters. And Elder Kimball was a very sensitive man. And... Um, so stuff like that bothered him deeply. But this is the this is the some of the rhetoric that that not just Kimball but others had inherited and been talking about throughout the 20th century, and um, it it becomes a problem for the church because now we have scriptures that, that are at the heart of this problem, and quite frankly, the the, the brother and the Salt Lake don't know what to do about this. Yeah, one of the um, one of the quotes that uh that was just and that that's one of the things that was just so shocking kind of pages i don't know 254 to 259 there's that quote about still having copper patches do, do you want to read that or do you want me to sure well why don't you go ahead um if you don't mind so uh another lds periodical the improvement era published a pair of stories in the 1920s illustrating the effect of conversion on native peoples one focused on Louis Armel, a Winnebago Indian who, quote, is said to be the object of scientific observation because for many years his skin has gradually been turning white. He is now 54 years old, the improvement era explained. He still has copper patches, but physicians believe that if he lives a few more years, he will become entirely white. <laughs> I have never heard that before. Yeah. Yeah, you, you you get a lot of this stuff, John, in in um, these magazines. And what I found that was interesting on page two hundred and sixty, where this these racial teachings, this whiteness theology, as I call it, it works its way into LDS popular culture, not surprisingly. And uh, I have to give a shout out to my wife on this. Somehow she came across this, but uh, she alerted me to a popular LDS quiz game called Seek, um, S-E-E-K. It it's was, like Trivial Pursuit for Mormons, basically. It's like Trivial Pursuit for Mormons. It was published in 1958. And one of the questions uh, is, is this. True or false, the Lamanites are promised that if they repent and accept the gospel, their skin color will eventually become white again. <laughs> this is a trivial game in 1958. And then uh, um, there are some other things going on. Uh, but the, the uh, Book of Mormon musical, the Broadway, which is really interesting. If some of your listeners may have, have seen it, I've seen it. It's uh, the music is fantastic. Anyway, um, Trace Parker and Matt Stone in the Book of Mormon Broadway uh, musical, they depict two naive and unsuspecting white missionaries sharing the white and delightsome scriptures with dark-skinned Ugandans embroiled in war. The scripture was supposed to comfort them, but the opposite occurred. And the missionary in the musical gives this very dark-skinned Ugandan a passage of scripture to sort of comfort him as he's embroiled in war. And it's about, it's 2 Nephi 30, uh, chapter, excuse me, chapter 30, verse 6, where it talks about black people being cursed. And the Ugandan looks at this verse and exclaims, how is this supposed to make things better for us? How is this book supposed to comfort us in war when you're telling us that God has cursed us? And <laughs> the Book of Mormon, uh, Parker and Stone, of course, are just making fun of racialized teachings. But the stuff is, it's everywhere throughout the 20th century. And there was even a politician that I quote um, that's, uh, worth noting um, a couple of interesting things. Let's see. So 
one example is um, Time Magazine picks up on how Mormons racialize themselves. And this is in 1959. And they comment about Mormons think that black people could be white again. And they're obviously mocking this. Um, Claire Booth Luce, a nationally syndicated um, journalist and also a former politician. She was a diplomat. And she wrote this really harsh story about George Romney as he was thinking about a presidential run in 1963. And um, a do-gooder Latter-day Saint, uh, it was a missionary actually from Florida, he saw the article and he was upset by it. He didn't like the idea that Lou said that Mormonism holds the dignity of the Negroes in low self-esteem. So he didn't like what she said about um, the Mormons and the brethren didn't like it either, by the way. Um, and he wrote back and he said that it is our understanding that the Negro, this is the missionary writing to, to color Luke Booth. It is our understanding that the Negro will in due time of the Lord have his dark skin coloring taken from him. That in keeping with God's divine justice, his limitations will be removed. <laughs> He's trying to make things better, but I don't think he realizes this is only making it worse. And then finally, there's a politician, a white politician in Utah who's courting the black vote. So this would be voters in parts of Salt Lake and mostly Ogden. He's running for political office. He's courting the black vote by informing them that their curse will be removed in time because God was going to turn them white again. And, and then lastly, I'll just say, I guess one last thing. In the 1960s, there was a, uh, a BYU, a couple of BYU students, they were doing a research project for their English class. And they were, they had heard that the church taught that black people uh, would re lose their curse one day. Now, let me just pause for a quick moment. The Native American stuff is all over the church, magazines, literature. So that wasn't in dispute. But the black issue, blacks were not part of this trope, at least publicly. But privately, it was talked about a lot. And then certainly black people read themselves into the Book of Mormon verses. Well, anyway, uh, these BYU students, they interviewed dozens of students for a research project, and they wanted to ask these students, what do you think about this whiteness theology? And this is what one of the students said, quote, I've heard it said, I don't recall where or from whom, one respondent noted, that the Negro joins the church, his skin, his skin will gradually become more light in color, the curse of Cain becoming less strong upon him. I've never seen a Negro to whom this has happened, so I don't know if it's true or not. Then another respondent explained, the motif of the Indian or Negro skin lightening in color upon joining the Mormon church is not uncommon in this author's experience. And this is, this is in 1969 when these two students are doing this research. So I want to go full forward just for a moment that um, you get this stuff well into the 21st century um, I, I mentioned a minute ago, there's a BYU religion professor who was talking about this in his religion class. Bot. And uh, I don't know if it was bot in this case. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, and the reason why I know this, it's a letter to the editor. This is 2008. Okay. So 2008. Um, not too long ago. And the a student writes in to the uh, letter to the editor, the Daily Universe, which is the campus newspaper. And basically, the student decries the notion that, that she had just... Um, been to a BYU religion class and his religion teacher uttered all of these horrible racial things about black people losing their skin color in the resurrection and all of this stuff. And she was just mortified by this. She didn't identify the teacher. Could have been bot, but could have been somebody else. Um, and then another story uh, is a, a BYU student who um, went home one day, uh, this white girl who went home one day and she was preparing lunch and then a little while later, her black roommate came home. And as the black girl came through the door, the white girl just stared at her, just gave her this really weird stare. And her black roommate said, what are you staring at? And the white girl said, I want to see if I'll be able to recognize you in the resurrection when you're white. And of course, the black girl was deeply offended by this, thinking that somehow that she wasn't good enough, that she would have to lose her skin pigment in order to qualify for the celestial kingdom. And um, so it's that kind of racial insensitivity that both BYU and other members of the church at large have been uttering. It's not surprising this happened in the 40s, 50s, and perhaps into the 60s, but 
the fact that there are pockets of this stuff going on well into the 21st century is it's really it's not good yeah and for me if i'm in a kind of i, I tried to kind of summarize you know, and this this kind of applies to the LGBT stuff as well as it applies to probably polygamy, as well as it probably applies to the church on, on blacks and the priesthood. There's kind of this pattern. They don't apologize. They're slow to make changes. They make the changes in piecemeal. They focus on the new emphasis, but not on any denunciations of the past. They claim that some revelation happened. So it's like a double miracle. It's like, it was a miracle then, but it's a miracle now. God's speaking to us. And somehow it comes off as this positive thing when really they're just changing an old policy that was really dysfunctional, but it's spun as a double miracle, a double revelation, right? There's no fanfare. They try and keep it on the down low. Um, they don't touch the scriptures. Maybe they'll tweak the headings a little bit. They try and get apologists to come out and make explanations for it. They often get members of the marginalized community to become the spokespeople of, you know, for the apologetics. And then they don't give credit to the real scholars or the real activists that actually were instrumental in the changes getting place. And in many instances, they excommunicate them at worst. And at best, they just completely ignore those scholars. And I think Lester Bush and Armand Moss and others, you know, you may want to speak to that here. And then if they just wait long enough, literally within one generation, everybody forgets. And it's as if we were always good. We never practiced polygamy. We we're always good with black people. We love the gays now. Because if you just wait generation and if it one generation, and if you handle it in this sort of piecemeal, don't apologize, just focus on the future, emphasize different things, call it a revelation. Um, you know, then then all of a sudden it goes down the memory hole and it's as if this thing never happened. And this happens generation after generation after generation. Now tell me if I've got the if I've uh if I've got the pattern somewhat accurate there. Well, no, I don't. I don't disagree with that. Just, just I want to remind uh, your listeners what revelation is in the church. They just they don't talk about it as openly as they need to, in my opinion. But revelation is is just sitting around the table, the apostles talking about something, debating it, as Hugh Brown said. Then they pray, and then the church president makes the decision, and that's the revelation. So there's, I think it's it's led to believe that there's more of this sort of burning bush mentality that God is speaking to them just as He spoke to Moses, and that's it's it's really. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to be critical and jump into their minds and, you know, God this or God that, and God may have influenced them or God didn't. I don't want to go there. But I just want to say that it's it's a little bit more mundane, this idea of revelation than people think. And um, it's not just praying and praying and praying and God, what do you say? What do you say? It's actually meeting with people. This is what I think we ought to do, Brother Elder Jones. What do you think? And they debate it and they talk about it. And they, they're, there is prayer involved, of course. Um, but... But then at the end of the day, the revelation is just the church president who said, okay, this is what we're going to do. And um, so I hope that that doesn't sound so grating on perhaps even some of your listeners who may be believers, uh, but that's really what it is. And I see this time and again in the documents that I read, their minutes, their memos, their journals. That's what revelation is. Um, let me share a quick story. And I, I share your passion over this, John. I do. Um, a quick story that's, that really I thought about often. Um, this this guy is not known to the church. His name is John Fitzgerald. He's he's dead now, died, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago. Anyway, um, he, he was a one-time LDS seminary teacher. And he uh, first wrote David O. McKay, who was then in the first presidency. Uh, actually, he was then the church president. I'm sorry. He wrote David O. McKay a letter in 1959. He said, this guy's a seminary teacher. And he would later leave the seminary and, and uh, become a high school or middle school principal in the Salt Lake area. Anyway, uh, but he went to President McKay, wrote him a note or a letter, and he said, I'm struggling with the priesthood issue. This is a church that's supposed to, to be no respecter of persons. And God is supposed to bring the gospel to every kindred nation, tongue and people. And how could we have this ban? I, I'm really struggling. It wasn't, you know, accusatory. It wasn't change it now. He was just trying to have the church president uh, deal with this, this issue. 
And over the years, he had written several letters to all the general authorities. He was so anguished over this. Um, well into the 60s, he's writing letters to the general authorities. And most of the general authorities would ignore him. And there are two people that didn't ignore him. Uh, David O. McKay would, would usually write back through his, sometimes personally, and other times um, through his secretary. So David O. did respond to him. He had the graciousness to do that. But as he got older and more feeble, I think that made it impossible to do. But anyway, um, Fitzgerald wrote uh, the general authorities, and only two people responded to him. One was a guy named Hardman Rector Jr., and the other one was Marion D. Hanks. And uh, I like to tell this story. I've shared this story with Elder Hanks' son. Um, it really, it's a meaningful story to me. Um, Hartman Rector Jr. wrote the most nasty and vicious letter back to this guy who's anguished over the band, just absolutely anguished. And it was vicious and it was nasty. Your eternal jeopardies and souls at stake and how could you dare not follow the brethren? This, this is a man who's just searching for answers. Well, it was. And Rector Jr. wrote this nasty note back, which is probably more of a commentary on him than anything else. And by contrast, Marion Hanks wrote the most beautiful, inspiring, moving letter back to this man. I share your pain. I share your anguish. I too wish the results were different. I too wish we could see a different outcome for our brothers and sisters of color. I mean, it was really this beautifully well-written letter. And it was on a Sunday afternoon when Hanks had been to church and he was looking out in his window um, at his home in the Salt Lake area. And he was looking at the mountains and just sort of gazing at the majesty of the mountains and reflecting on this man's pain and anger or frustration. And anyway, um, so the church did make the, the change. And uh, this man became just really upset and just to the point where he was demoralized over the ban. And by 1972, he he crossed a Rubicon. He started writing, uh, publishing uh Letters to the editor, the Salt Lake Tribune, he and a couple of his friends. And now this time it turned uh, accusatory and calling the brother and racist and all of that. And um, he, uh, they, they excommunicated him. And he was just so pained. The church that he loved, they cut him off. And he appealed his excommunication to the First Presidency and Eneldon Tanner upheld it. This is in 1973. And some of the people that... Um, he thought were his friends would have come to his aid, didn't give him the defense that he needed. Um, some people did, like Sterling McMurrin, but McMurrin was sort of out of the church. It wasn't sort of, he was out of the church and didn't have the weight, but he was disappointed in Lowell Benyon, who he thought was a fellow kindred. And what he didn't understand was Lowell Benyon, um, who worked for the church for a long time and himself had been fired over this very issue in 1962, that uh, Benyon worked from the inside. And Benyon recognized that if you start putting pressure from the on the brethren externally, that, that is the quickest way to shut it all down. So Benyon didn't do that. and um, But John Fitzgerald was upset that Benyon didn't come to his defense like he thought he should. Well, anyway, um, so a couple last thoughts on the story. So he gets excommunicated and Ellen Tanner upholds the excommunication over the ban issue. That's all it was. A good faithful Latter-day Saint lost his membership over the ban. And by 1978, um, when I was, uh, I was in the Carter papers and I saw this man's letters to President Carter, he, he turned bitter. He said, um, you've got to, you've got to, dear President Carter, you've got to investigate the Mormons. They're racist. They're this, they're that. And uh, he started sharing things from the writings of Joseph Fielding Smith saying that Negroes were the inferior race. And he would Xerox passages from, from Joseph Fielding Smith books. So that when Mormons would publicly say, we're not racist, he would then write, yes, we are. And look, here's the evidence. Um, this is during the Stanford protests against BYU in 1969, when that became public, he would write the Stanford people letters. And he went to Stanford too for a graduate degree. So he had a connection there. But anyway, um, so John Fitzgerald was deeply hurt by this. He wrote President Carter asking them to investigate the Mormon church. And then after the revelation's over, he writes President Kimball uh, a note. And I found this note in the, the archives and the letters that I, I've seen in President Kimball's papers. And he congratulates him um, for having the courage to to do this and to lifting the ban and making it right. And he he uh, bears his soul once again, just as he did earlier, decade earlier with Marion Hanks. He said, I lost my membership in this church that I loved and over this very issue. Where does this leave me in God's eyes um, now that the ban's done?
and unfortunately I don't have a response letter. I wish maybe there is, and I just haven't seen it, but anyway, so to your point, John, about, um, these things, they hurt real people. And, uh, it's one thing to say, Oh, I hate the church. I'm out, you know, but this guy is not in that camp. And, uh, to think that he went to his grave being marginalized in the church that he loved is, is tough. And, and I know both of us know, and, Others in your listening audience know people who love the church. They want to remain in the church, but they they can't remain in the church who doesn't love them back. And that's where the pain exists. Absolutely. We should have covered this when we were talking about the scriptures, but but I wanted to come back to it. You wanted to make sure we covered this. Is some of the classic apologetic tropes or responses regarding uh, race and the priesthood, and, and specifically with the Book of Mormon, what I hear, and I still hear this now, I think even Kwaku, a, a prominent uh, African-American Mormon apologist on YouTube, makes this argument that that the Book of Mormon talks about a curse and then the mark of the curse and how somehow they're different and we th we there's been a misperception that the mark of the curse was the skin but really the mark of the curse was the spirit and their countenance and that we've got it all wrong that the book of mormon never talked about race and dark skin and a curse that we've just interpreted it wrong i've heard that i've heard that the book of mormon historical characters were racist and that the only reason racism is in the book of mormon is because alma and helaman and uh, Benjamin, I guess they were products of their time. And so there's racism in it because they were racist. You know, I've heard different um, attempts at, at providing apologetics for some of this racist teachings. Can you give us a highlight of the, of the apologetic responses that you're most familiar with and your reactions to each one? Well, my reactions are simple. It's I, I'm I'm going to reveal my bias. I don't have much patience for apologetics. I I think that apologetics is it's a um, it's it's a defense of the faith, and it's it's a it's a the modus operandi of apologists. Um, the way they operate is we have our conclusions, which is the church is true, and we're going to go back retroactively or retrospectively and find evidences that it is true. And if you're involved in honest scholarship, that's not the way it works. You simply have a hypothesis, an educated guess about where you think the evidence takes you. And hopefully you have the nimbleness and the flexibility to change your hypothesis as the evidence dictates and you go where the, where it takes you. And, um, as historians, we have an obligation to um, to be balanced and fair in our treatment of others. Um, hopefully, we follow the golden rule. This is what I try to do. I, I try to write about people that, um, in a way that I would uh, want people to write about me. I mean, if somebody, were, not that I'm important, but if somebody were to write about my life, um, I would understand that they'd have to write about some of my blemishes and some of the poor decisions, perhaps, that I've made. Um, that's That's part of our our humanness and that's so necessary. And, um, and so for apologists to have conclusions that the church is true and they work backwards, I just, that's just not, that's not good. And this isn't to say that you can't write something that's faith promoting or that makes your, your historical subject look good. I'm going to be honest. I mean, in my book that I'm working on now, I think president Kimball's a hero in the priesthood revelation. If, when you realize what he has to overcome, um, he's got all these bigots in the 12 and he's, he's got to work with these guys to get them to understand that this is how we have to move the church forward. We've got to get rid of this odious ban. And really the way that he does it, it's a profile in courage and it's an exercise in effective management by working with them both collectively and individually. I, I really think he's a hero of the moment and it's not lost on the other things that he's taught about our gay brothers and sisters. That, that pains me actually. Um, but when it comes to the race issue, President Kimball is courageous. He's able to do what David O. McKay can't do. And in order to, to be fair to David O. McKay, David O. McKay was, you know, two decades earlier, which did matter, right, the civil rights movement. So uh, Kimball had time on his hands or in his, his corner. But anyway, um, so I don't like apologetics because um, sometimes I just find it terribly dishonest. 
And the best apologetics that I've seen in the church um, take the most charitable view of something, which is okay. That's okay. Uh, but when that charitable view moves into a, uh, a corner of disingenuousness, I think that's when you're running up against some challenging things. And I've seen that happen with farms over and over and over again. And with the race issue, we've seen a spate of things about garments and race. And we've seen uh, distinctions between curses and markings. And, you know, for your listener on the podcast, I'm not familiar with that podcast referred to, but that's not a, that's, there's nothing new in any of that stuff. Um, General authorities for years, some of them have made distinctions between the mark and the curse. And uh, Marion Hanks is a great example of this. He never thought that black people were cursed, but that there was some, uh, or, or actually that there was a mark that, that designated God's disfavor. The, the curse would have been, of course, their spiritual souls. And that was uh, something that Hanks had worked out himself. But that wasn't the teaching of the church. And uh, Spencer Kimball grappled with this. I've seen his scriptures from 1954. I've held them. I've taken pictures of, of what he wrote in the margins of his scriptures. That, that's a really interesting thing because it gives you a snapshot in time how they're looking at some of these racialized verses. And he too is working through these markings and cursings and all of that stuff. But that's not the, that's not the prevailing notion of the church. The, the Joseph Fielding Smith wing of the church wins out for much of the 20th century. And um, when the scriptures say that black people are cursed or, or Lamanite people are cursed, they're cursed. It means what it says it means. He takes this very fundamentalist, literalist view. And so we get these farms people today that are making all kinds of connections to the ancient world. And they're trying to put this positive spin on it. And I, quite frankly, don't even engage in that nonsense because um, what I look at as a historian is how did the people at the time interpret these verses? Not how farms people at BYU pay to defend the church deal with it. That, or that, Maxwell Institute or FAIR. Or Maxwell or anybody. That is so inconsequential to me. What I'm looking at as a historian is what did leaders say in the moment? What did their flock uh, think when they heard their leaders utter this? And so if I were to debate a Maxwell person or a farms person, I know farms is, I, I always say farms, but they're, they're no longer, but. Um, anyway, if I were to debate a, a church apologist today and they want to get into the ancient world, I'm like, who cares? I don't care. Um, I would focus on how a black person in Illinois, when he read the Book of Mormon for the first time, what he thought about it. I would look at a Native American. That's what I've done in this essay. I'm using the words of people themselves. And so for anyone on their high horse today, an apologist to tell me it's all metaphorical, I would simply say that's fine, you're entitled to believe that, but that's not what Latter-day Saints of color interpret it as. And that is certainly not what Joseph Fielding Smith and some of the other hardliners meant it as. So, um, you know, the, the greatest line uh, from this essay is Joseph Fielding Smith, when he meets with these religious educators, as I mentioned, in the fall of 1954, they have questions about this. Actually, it's August of 1954. And he says, quote, we have actual real life uh, we have t actual tangible examples of the skin color of Negroes turning lighter. I don't know how you interpret that metaphorically. And it's quite frankly, it's disingenuous to, to suggest otherwise. And I don't, I'm not usually this dogmatic or emphatic about kinds of things like this because people can disagree, of course, respectfully, but this is, this is pretty darn clear. And it's consistent with what Joseph Fielding Smith has said in his other writings and in other sermons. And so it's this reader reception theory that, how people at the time interpret these texts and these sermons. And it's clear that people of color are interpreting it the way for which it was meant to be interpreted, that there is something going on with your skin color if you uh, behave in a certain way, you keep the commandments and you accept God's grace. And so um, I, I hope that answers your question. I, I think apologetics, I know there's a lot of discussion in the church about apologetics, John. Some people are into it. There's good apologetics, there's bad apologetics. I've heard we, we use that term a lot. I've heard Richard Bushman's an apologist. I, I don't I don't see that that he's an apologist. Um, we've heard I don't know. I've heard other LDS scholars that I wouldn't agree are apologists, um, but there are certainly people who are apologists, and they have devoted their entire career to apologetics, and um, they feel like it's the God's call them to defend the church. When I say defend the church, I'm talking about defend the church at all costs. 
And even if, if it means moving into that corner of disingenuousness. And so um, I, that's not healthy for the church. And that's one of the reasons that the church shut down farms. And um, because they were just taking this to the umph degree and they were causing more harm than good. So for a scholar like me, I'm, I, but I want to just be clear on my bias um, that, that I want to write as full and as accurate a history as I can. And that means telling the good, the bad, and the ugly. And when I was writing my Benson book, uh, he's a right-wing extremist. I don't know how else to say it. And I, I really desperately wanted to find stuff that would soften him because I, I want to capture people in their full complexity and uh, the different shades of their, their, their life. And just to sort of create Benson or turn somebody like Benson uh, into a one-dimensional figure, I think for me personally is deeply problematic. And so I strive to find uh, different things. And one of the things in the priesthood revelation that I write about is, that's interesting is um, each of the apostles that, that talk about the priesthood revelation, some don't, Benson's one of them, does not talk about it hardly anywhere. Although you see shades of it in other people's journals, but in terms of his direct voice, you don't see it. Um, at least that I that I found. But anyway, all of the apostles to a man talk about this revelation being one of the most intense, sublime experiences of their life. And in some instances, I'll let them speak for themselves about what they thought it meant and how it happened. And uh, but I also talk about some of the downsides to it. That um, after the revelation's over, that uh, Bruce McConkie and Boyd Packer. Uh, they have a fanciful imagination. They talk about angels being there and church presidents, and even Jesus himself was there, Boyd Packer said. And that got back to Spencer Kimball, and he wasn't happy about that. He said, caution them, don't say that. That's not true. And quit quit talking about you know the, all these angelic beings being there. That's just simply not a route we want to go. And as a historian, you know, I have to ask myself a simple question. Why would they do this? They've had this intense moment, this, this really wonderful uh, experience with each other, this, this camaraderie that they felt. Um, why would they feel the need to, such, to, to embellish it so drastically? And that's something that I'm writing about now is this, this idea of why McConkie and, and um, Packer would do that when the other apostles didn't do that, but these two did. And for me, that's one of the great arguments for this book is because, you know, this book has footnotes, it has citations. And if anybody's going to try and claim that when they said skin, they didn't mean skin, or when they said a curse, it didn't apply to the skin, whatever backflip somersault apologetic you want to use, just grab this book, turn to chapter 11. Is that what it is? Uh, chapter 10. And you could just read them citation after citation. You can't change people's mind, but at least you can provide evidence. And this is pretty much uh, this is pretty much conclusive evidence as far as I'm concerned. Really quickly, uh, as we're kind of wrapping up here, I want to make sure we cover anything else you want to cover. But do you mind just paying a quick tribute to both Lester Bush and Armand Moss and their role in all of this? Because I think those are at least two unsung heroes. Yeah, and I'll add a third person, my good friend Newell Bringhurst. I think yeah, that, and um, Newell. I agree, I, and Newell. Yeah, I think that uh, my friend Paul Reeve and myself and other scholars today who of a younger generation who write about uh, the church and race, I mean, I don't want to speak for Paul, but I think he would feel comfortable with what I'm about to say is we stand on the shoulders of Newell Bringhurst, Armin Moss, and Lester Bush. And it's those three guys who really paved the way just briefly uh, about their careers. Lester Bush wrote this pathbreaking article in 1973. I go into great length about why this is so influential um, in my in the book that I'm working on now. Lester had access to first pregnancy in Quorum of the 12 Minutes that um, uh, anyway, that nobody had seen before. And so his 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 work is revolutionary. Um, and it's published in Dialogue in 1973. And it's probably to this day um, the most important essay that Dialogue has ever published. I think Devery Anderson, my friend Devery at Signature would agree with that. He's written about uh, dialogue over the years. Um, anyway, so this this wonderful 1973 article um, in which he argues that the band began um, with uh, Brigham Young, not with Joseph Smith, and that's he's the first person that goes on record to to say that. That's really an extraordinary claim. 
um, at the time because everybody had thought in the church that it was Joseph Smith's thing. And that's just saying that's not the case. Um, secondly, uh, Armin Moss. Very quick. Didn't, didn't Lester Bush uh, get punished by the church for, for his scholarship? Wasn't he marginalized uh, or yeah. disciplined formally or informally? He was, yeah. In um, so his just a, a quick backstory uh, about Lester. So he 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 was a practicing Latter Day Saint. Um, he got he's a medical doctor by profession. Got involved in sort of a peripheral way on the race issue as a Latter Day Saint. He just was interested in it, so started researching it. Uh, I'm going to skip a lot of the details, but. Um, his brother was at BYU and his brother alerted him one day and he said, Hey, Lester. Uh, so Lester was working as a medical doctor. So uh, would have been his younger brother. He said, there's this, there's this great collection of apostles and first pregnancy minutes on the Negro issue. And I know that you have an interest in that and it's at BYU and, and you should see it. And so Lester on his next trip to uh, Utah, he went and he saw it in a librarian named Chad Flake. It hooked him up. And, uh, Chad Flake probably was doing something on the margins, <laughs> but he had uh, Flake knew about this very valuable collection on on blacks in the priesthood. And it was it was from the private papers of Apostle Adam Benyon that his family had donated after Apostle Benyon died in 1958. And collections of this nature are supposed to go to the church archives where they're locked away and they're in a vault. And instead, the family, for whatever reason, donated them to the BYU uh, library. And in theory, when that happens, unless designated otherwise, they're supposed to be open. So Chad Flake knew about this valuable collection. Somehow the word got out. A couple of BYU students had somehow got access to it, and that angered the brother when they found out. And then Lester Bush got access, and he made a massive copy of all of it. And, and so I have his copy. This is one of the things that I work from and some of the minutes that I use in my own work. So anyway, Lester Bush has access to this stuff, and he makes this 400-page compilation on the Negro, as he calls it. It's just a privately done thing in 1972. He gives copies to a few people, including Boyd Packer of the Council of the Twelve, which was a big mistake, um, as opposed to other people who might have been more generous or liberal with it. And But Packer was probably the wrong person to give it to. Um, and that was Marion Hanks' own words, by the way. Uh, so he gave it to a few of his friends. Um, so the brethren are angry that, that somehow these private and confidential minutes are being seen by a Latter-day Saint. And uh, Dallin Oaks, who's then the president, this new president at BYU, Spencer Kimmel wrote him a kind of frank note. He said, what is going on? I heard that this librarian Flake is giving this stuff out. And anyway, Oaks just said, I've instructed Flake to put this under lock and key. And furthermore, Elder Kimball, we should just remove this stuff altogether and put it to Salt Lake. And so it was Oaks's idea to remove it from BYU and uh, move it to Salt Lake so it wouldn't be available to people. Anyway, from that massive 400-page compilation, which is mostly from the meeting minutes of the Apostle Benyon papers, um, it also deals with some additional research that, that Lester Bush had done in the George Albert Smith papers of the University of Utah. And also a few things that were made uh, available to him at the Church History Archives. So it's this remarkable collection. And from this 400-page uh, document, uh, Lester writes this very detailed article in which he completely revises the whole priesthood narrative. Um, there is no revelation. Um, it's not in all these minutes. So that's, a, that's quite a revelation. And that there was nothing inspired about any of this stuff. It begins with Brigham Young. And so this is deeply problematic. And he's trying to help the church. I, you know, he wasn't a, he wasn't an activist. He wasn't trying to say, aha, my, my research is going to um, force the brethren to rethink the ban. It was, it was a really a policy more than anything. It wasn't a doctrinal practice. But that wasn't, that wasn't what he's trying to do. He just thought it would help the church. And um, anyway, so it turns out that some of the brethren were angry. I mean, Apostle McConkie denounced it as, quote, crap. And Mark Peterson's angry. And by 1983, uh, so just a handful of years after the revelation, Mark Peterson instructed J. Willard Marriott, uh, Lester Bush's state president in the Washington, D.C. area, to call him in for an interview. And the implication was take his membership. And by that point, Bush had written some other things, something on the word of wisdom. And he had uh, been the editor of Dialogue, which the brethren hated. They hated Dialogue. They thought it was like, satan's journal 
<laughs> and uh, Hugh Brown didn't feel that way, but some of the, the conservative general authorities did. So they hated Dialogue already. He was the editor of Dialogue. Um, anyway, so Bill Marriott called him in, and Marriott, um, he uh, he interviewed Lester Bush, and he didn't do what Elder Peterson wanted him to do. He, Lester's a good man. We're going to leave him alone. And uh, Lester eventually drifted away from the church. I'm not sharing anything that I shouldn't reveal, by the way. This is Lester's shared this story in public. And it's been published in the Journal of Mormon History, I think, so, a lot of this. So anyway, um, so unfortunately, he went after him. Armin Mosh is another scholar who is, um, he wrote a, a, an influential essay in dialogue in 1981 called Fading the Pharaoh's Curse. Really a nice piece of work for the time. And then uh, Armin's uh, magnum opus was a book that was published in 2003 that he'd been working on for a number of years called All Abraham's uh, Children. And basically, it's about changing conceptions of Mormons and lineage and race. And so it's really a wonderful piece of scholarship. And, and then the brethren had, Mark Peterson, uh, had pestered Armin over the years. And um, Armin, uh, unlike Lester, though, stayed with the church and uh, worked out his differences. But certainly Armin had been on the margins on the church for a long time, meaning not, not his testimony necessarily, but just the margins with church officials in Salt Lake. And depending on the time and the general authority, he had moments where he was in their favor and could do special assignments for them. And other times where he was just a little bit too liberal, a little bit too open for them. But uh, Armin died last summer and he was he remained active and a believer to the very end. And he was in good the good graces of most of the general authorities. But he definitely had his licks over the years. And then finally, my, my close friend, uh, Newell Bringhurst, we've been close friends for a number of years. We talk often on the phone. We exchange emails frequently. He reads everything I wrote, uh, I write about race, as did Armin. Um, and I'm sad to say that that's not the case anymore since he's gone. But anyway, um, Newell uh, wrote a dissertation at the University of California, Davis in the early 1970s on Mormons and race. And um, Newell was influenced by Lester Bush's pathbreaking work. Newell got a copy of the 400-page uh, compilation on the Negro, uh, as uh, Lester called it, and that influenced uh, Newell's work. And by 1981, Newell wrote the first monograph. Well, I shouldn't say the first. There was a, another book that was written in 1969 that it really wasn't well-written or well-researched. But anyway, um, Newell wrote a book called Saints, Slaves, and Blacks that came out in 1981. And what was really interesting about the book is Newell is one of the first scholars to really talk about the Mormon racial story using, to also talk about the scriptures. That's something that, that Newell and Armin at the time did not do. And in fact, they even criticized Newell a little bit saying, you know, leave that out. That's different. That's separate. And Newell was the first scholar to really talk about uh, the Mormon racial narrative uh, using the scriptures, that there's something we, we've, in order to understand Joseph Smith's uh, views on race, we've got to look at the scriptures he produced. I mean, that sounds doesn't sound you know far fetched today, but it, it was then, at least to Lester and Armin, and uh, Paul Reeve and and Max Mueller, who's written uh, uh, along with Paul, they both written splendid books on Mormons and race from the 19th century, and they they look at Mormon scripture quite a bit. And well, it's Newell that really uh, made that central, and I think Armin and Paul would or Armin, excuse me. Newell and Max would both agree to that. Anyway, um, so Newell wrote his book in 1981, and um, it, it had some bumps in this Mormon scholarly community. People just were not ready in 1981 to deal with this story, with the difficulty of Mormons in scripture and race, with uh, this, this whole idea about curses. And this is in 81, a few years after the revelation. And so he got some harsh reviews um, from some Latter-day Saint scholars. But now there's the book has been republished by um, not Benchmark Books, uh, Coford Books. And Paul Reeve wrote a nice uh, blurb for the book. And um, it's, you know, it's been widely praised and deservedly so. So Newell Bringhurst, Lester Bush, and, and Armin Moss are the three pioneers in Mormons and race. And I, I think that that's, you know, we can't praise them enough for their, their path-breaking work. And now you're carrying the torch a little bit. A little bit. Yeah, I think um, one of the things that I have, Newell and I talk about this often because we're, we're such close friends, and I, also Armin. I used to talk to Armin about this often, that um, 
that I have an advantage over those guys uh, in that I've been able to see collections that they haven't, they, they couldn't see. And, um, and that obviously enriches the story. And so one of the things I share, even as we speak, I, I share my drafts in progress with Newell and, uh, and I'll share them with a bunch of other people when it gets further along, but rule Newell will read some of the early drafts. And, um, I just wrote this detailed uh, chapter on the Genesis group, the origins of the Genesis group, which is really fascinating. But anyway, Newell reads this stuff and he's like, it makes me happy when he writes back, wow, I didn't know any of this stuff. I mean, he's uh -huh. a guy who spent his entire adult life writing about Mormons and race and he doesn't know any of this stuff that I'm writing about. And the reason is, is because as we both like to talk about, I've had access to collections that he hasn't seen and restricted collections. And these are, um, I should tell your listeners how this happens. Um, I'm privileged to, I work with people to win, win their trust. And that's why I'm extremely guarded about when people ask me for things. I, I, I'm sorry, I can't give it to you because I was, this was given to me to write about and only me. And if, um, and occasionally I'll ask the people who donated the papers to me, I'll say, you know, so-and-so wants to look at this. Are you okay? And I've had a few times where they said, okay, that's fine. Just that person. Thanks for asking. Because that's always the agreement. I'll never share this unless I get permission. And then I've had a couple of times where, no, this is just for you. And I have to honor that. And I do honor that. And um, so I've, I've, I've been privileged to see stuff at the LDS Church History Archives. Um, BYU has, I've seen a ton of restricted collections there. And then lastly, I've um, I work with the children of general authorities who've been so gracious in sharing their fathers, their late father, the general authorities, diaries with me and private papers. And um, I've gone this route many times where I have to interview them and they they want to know where my heart is and where I stand with this or that. And, and uh, you know, I've passed the interviews and they, they give me access to this material. And this is the stuff that I have to create the work that I create. I love it. Well, I've said it before. I'll say it again. You're a blessing to our people, Matt. Harris. And so is Signature Books. And so is this book, the LDS Gospel Topic Series. Please go buy it now. Support Mormon history and Mormon scholarship. Uh, we, we hope to have other authors from the chapters in this book on, including Newell. Is there anything else you want to say in closing about your chapter in this book or about this book? I think... Um... I think that uh, I no, I think I've said what I need to say. I, I but just the, I guess one thing on the race and priesthood. It's it's a great document to where Latter Day Saints can say, you know what, Brother Jones, you don't say that black people are cursed. That that is offensive, and the church no longer teaches that. And here's the document on on LDS.org or whatever the website is now. And that that really cannot be. Um, Underemphasized. I mean, it, it gives people an authoritative document to appeal to when they hear racism, and and it it behooves Latter Day Saints to continue to share these essays with their friends. And there are deficiencies, there are problems. There's no question, but I hope it's clear from our discussion today, and I hope it's clear from subsequent uh, contributors that that there are a lot of positives, certainly more positives than negatives. And um, these, the best thing we can say about these essays is they need wide circulation. And I'm excited that you're going to have some of the contributors on um, really, really good scholars. The tone, the language, the scholarship was impeccable. And Newell and I really scratched our heads and, and thought a lot about who we wanted to participate. And uh, we really found a nice group of people. And so we're pleased with the final outcome. All right. Tell us really quickly what books you're working on that you can tell us about. Well, the Black and Mormon book is is definitely that's that's the one I'm actively working on now. It's about eighty five percent of the way through. Um, the second book next up in the queue is wait, and that'll come out approximately when Black and Mormon. Ooh, good question. Probably it's probably a year, year and a half out. Okay. So yeah, I still have to finish. I'm eighty five percent through, and then I'm going to send it to some of my friends to critique, and then I'll send it to a press. And then um, the next project is called. It's a biography that I'm proud to say that Signature Books will publish. They're a wonderful press. My friends there do great work. Um, it's called Hubie Brown, Mormonism's Progressive Apostle. So um, 
for some of your younger listeners, they might not know Hubie Brown, but he was he was the person that liberals in the church loved. He was a voice of fresh air amidst some of the fundamentalists. And um, so I've been privileged to see his papers and work with some of his family members. And um, that's the next book in the queue. And then I'm scheduled to write two other biographies, one on J. Reuben Clark for a special series at the University of Illinois Press, a short biography series on influential Mormon leaders. So I was asked by um, um, a couple of professors who edited it to uh, contribute a, a book on J. Reuben Clark. And then finally, I'm contracted to do a book um, on Henry D. Moyle, who was an important financier of the church. This is a member of the First Presidency in the 50s and early 60s, who was responsible for expanding the church's portfolio. If you want to understand why the LDS church owns three-fourths of Florida today, the answer is Henry D. Moyle. And uh, third, that, wait, it was it's like three, two or three percent of Florida, right? No, I'm exaggerating. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's been a long day. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. No, no, yeah, they, they don't own most of Florida, but yeah, you're right. They own two percent. Two percent of Florida is a lot. Two <laughs> percent of Florida is a lot, and it's Henry Moyle, Henry Dinwiddie Moyle, uh, who um, is responsible for this. And just to give a teaser about Henry Moyle, his he overextended the church's finances, and it left him out in the cold in the early '60s, be just before he died. The first presidency had shut him off. They were upset with he was overextending. The church's credit and um they they cut him out of everything and he died a broken-hearted man died in florida and it crushed his widow and she eventually drifted away from the church because of the treatment of her late husband sad story really well those are all super important books so i'm super uh excited that you're working on those i'll, I'll try and be patient yeah i get sleep once in a while but <laughs> you sleep when you're dead sleeping's overrated <laughs> All right. The book is The Gospel Topic Series, A Scholarly Engagement by Matt Harris, Newell Bringhurst, edited by them and lots of authors. Go signature books. Please buy this book. I will take you out to lunch or dinner or have a party once COVID's over. If you uh, buy this book or the last Ezra Tap Benson book, um, Matt, you take care. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. We'll have you on any time. All right. Will you come back? Sure. Of course. All right. Um, and, uh, and listeners, I just want to thank everyone so much for joining us today on Mormon stories. Uh, thanks for your comments and questions. Thanks to everyone who donates. If you want to see programs like this continue less than one out of a thousand of you are donating. So if, if you could just go right down on mormonstories.org, click on the donate button at the top of the page Become a monthly donor at whatever amount you uh, can afford. We'll keep existing and we'll keep Mormon stories going for another decade or two. For as long as you'll support us, we'll keep going, but we need your support. So please donate to Open Stories Foundation. It's tax deductible um, in the U.S. We're transparent in our finances and uh, we'll keep bringing you great content. Uh, thank you so much to everyone. Please, to, we've got lots of great stuff coming. So uh, stay tuned, stay in touch, don't be a stranger. Reach out if you, uh, if you uh, have questions or need support, and uh, we'll keep doing great work for you. Thanks, everybody. You guys take care, and we'll see you guys all again soon on another episode of Mormon Stories.